burning neighborhoods, strings of horrific axe murders, a burger joint selling human flesh, and only one question. You mad bro? Fans of internet memes from the mid-2000s might remember one inescapable image commonly known as Trollface. Trollface and his trademark grin symbolized mischief and troublemaking, and generally making the world a more chaotic place. Over time, as is often the case on the internet, new variations on the image began to spring up as users created their own spin on Trollface. At first, it was all relatively harmless, but then again, this is the internet. Nothing online stays harmless forever. Over time, more sinister variations on Trollface began to surface, memes consisting of joke instructions that took a dark, destructive turn. This new spin on the Trollface quickly became known as Trollje, and often featured disturbing content presented in a joking, prankster format. Still, not something to be too concerned about. Just standard edgy posting, trying to get a reaction by shocking people, right? Not exactly. On December 24th, 2020, in Melbourne, Australia, a college student named Lee Miller received an early Christmas present from her classmate and ex-boyfriend, Peter Whitkins. The two had parted on relatively good terms, and she was glad to receive a gift from him. When she opened it, she was delighted to see that he had purchased her a jar of expensive French facial moisturizer, one she had been interested in trying back when they were together. As she prepared to do her skincare routine that night, she thought about how thoughtful the gift was and how sweet Peter was. Maybe she'd made a mistake breaking things off. Maybe after the holidays, she could reach out and see if they could give things another shot. As she unscrewed the jar of moisturizer, she didn't notice that its color and smell seemed just a bit off. She just dipped her fingers inside and began to apply the cream to her face. All of a sudden, she realized what a horrible mistake that was. Her face began to burn, her skin screaming out in a pain like none she'd ever felt before. She screamed, clawing at her face, desperate for a way to make it stop. Neighbors heard the screams and called emergency services. When paramedics arrived on the scene, her condition had gotten even worse. They restrained her, sedated her, and took her to the hospital for treatment. The face cream was brought in for testing and was found to have been tampered with. It had been spiked with Gimpy Gimpy, one of the world's most excruciatingly painful plants. Peter was promptly brought in for questioning, but refused to explain why he had done it. He was charged with assault, and officers inspected his home for anything that might suggest a motive. On his computer, they found the most recent post he had read before, presumably committing the crime. It was a Trollja meme, formatted as a comic, and it read, Want to get back at your girlfriend? Step 1. Find out her favorite facial cream. Step 2. Procure the facial cream. Step 3. Obtain Utrecan plant. Use gloves. Step 4. Blend the leaves with the cream, then repack it. Step 5. Give girlfriend the gift. The meme contained a sixth step, but it was redacted in all official records for reasons that will soon become clear. This incident caught the attention of the SCP Foundation, who swiftly looked into the meme as a potential anomaly. As they were conducting their investigation, it happened again. Another Trollja meme, another horrible crime with an inexplicable motive. On December 28, 2020, in Banda Aka, Indonesia, 15 terminally ill patients were found dead in their hospital beds. That wouldn't necessarily be cause for alarm, given the nature of their conditions, except for the cause of death. The patients did not pass away due to their illnesses. Instead, each and every one of them was killed by carbon monoxide poisoning. At first, the case was a mystery, until security footage revealed that one of the hospital's orderlies, Aziz Hidiat, replaced the patient's oxygen tanks with tanks of carbon monoxide. He was promptly arrested and brought in for questioning. During the interrogation, he repeated again and again that he was not trying to harm the patients, but he was delivering them. The police officers asked who he was trying to deliver them to, but he refused to answer. A search through his computer browser history uncovered another Trollja meme. This one read, Want to help people? Step 1. Get a job at a hospital. Step 2. Make friends with the patients. Step 3. Enter oxygen tank room. Step 4. Replace tanks with carbon monoxide. Step 5. Release them from their defective vessels. The SCP Foundation had been in the process of formulating a hypothesis, but now it was confirmed. 
These variations on the Trollja meme contained a cognitohazardous switch that would cause a reader to carry out the acts described in the comic. The switch appeared to specifically be contained in the conclusive line, hence its removal from all official records of any identified anomalous memes. An estimated 0.25% of those exposed to an anomalous meme would be affected by this cognitohazard. The phenomenon was given the designation SCP-6661, and the memes themselves SCP-6661-1. These first two incidents were nicknamed the Pretty Girl Incident and the Sleepy Time Incident, respectively. Several other notable incidents occurred following the discovery of SCP-6661. On January 20, 2021, the Harvester Valley Incident occurred. Oliver Desjardins of Alberta, Canada packed his bags full of camping supplies, fresh drinking water, a flashlight, and an axe. He kissed his wife and children goodbye, and he drove out to the local tourist campground. After darkness fell, he left his tent, axe in hand, and walked from camp to camp, slaughtering anyone he came across. He managed to kill 10 people and injure 14 before he was killed by the authorities. Everyone who knew Oliver was shocked, saying he had no history of violent behavior. He wouldn't even kill a spider when he found one inside. His wife gave the authorities permission to examine his internet activity, and sure enough, they found a trolljamine left open. Want to have a good holiday? Step 1. Pack necessary equipment and items. Step 2. Say goodbye to family. Step 3. Drive to the valley campgrounds. Step 4. Find local shepherd and his flock. Step 5. Steal a little lamb. Step 6. Relish upon its flesh for it will be your dying meal. Step 7. Data expunged. After reading the meme, the Foundation determined that a nearby farmer was indeed missing one of his sheep. The bones of the missing sheep were later discovered near the campground where the attack took place. This new finding suggested that the cognitohazardous effects tended to result in a largely literal interpretation of the given meme's text. Oliver himself could not be questioned about his actions due to his death on the scene, so there were no more answers to be uncovered in his case. On February 16, 2021, in Bratislava, Slovakia, a man named Josef Prochaska began displaying unusual behavior at around 0200 hours. He drove through his neighborhood in his water truck and began using it to spray kerosene upon nearby buildings throughout the area. The sound and the smell woke several neighbors who attempted to reason with Joseph and make him stop what he was doing. He ignored them as if in a trance and carried on with his task. Frightened for their safety as well as that of their clearly unwell neighbor, they called emergency services to the scene. Emergency services arrived to find Joseph standing in front of the active nozzle, kerosene blasting directly onto him. He didn't even seem to notice. As the authorities approached him, calling out to him, asking him to come with them, he acknowledged their presence. He smiled broadly and pulled something from his pocket. All too late, they realized what it was, a road flare. He ignited it, and the area was swiftly engulfed in flames. 26 people were killed in the blast, and hundreds of thousands in property damage occurred as a result. That was shocking enough, but additional emergency responders who arrived at the scene saw something even more bizarre. It began to rain, putting out some of the flames. As the water touched the kerosene-soaked bodies and landscape, paramedics were completely taken aback as they saw corpses and bits of rubble begin to float up into the air up into the sky. One man later described what he had seen to the police, saying, It was as if they were floating on the water that was falling from the sky. The authorities dismissed this account, but the SCP Foundation knew better. This had to be another Trollja incident. Indeed, it was. And on Joseph's computer, they found the guilty meme. Oil is lighter than water. Step 1. Cover yourself in oil. Step 2. Feels good. Step 3. Cover others in oil. Step 4. Data expunged. Somehow this particular instance of SCP-6661 had managed to alter the laws of physics to bend them to its will. It was a troubling development and not something they cared to see repeated. Containment procedures were swiftly put into place. Web crawlers monitored the internet for any appearances of Trollja, particularly those that seemed to have cognitohazardous properties. If they could track these instances and delete them from circulation, perhaps they could prevent any more needless destruction. During the monitoring process, some of the web crawlers detected an instance of SCP-6661-1 with a heavily distorted concluding step. Before expunging this step, 
Junior researcher Mikel Ramirez edited out the distortion and scanned the image through a spectrogram generator. This was, it should be noted, without prior authorization. The spectrogram generated audio, three recognizable words. Junior researcher Ramirez was reprimanded for breaching protocol, but his work proved to be valuable enough to warrant additional research. With the sign-off of the O5 Council, a spectrogram was constructed with a reply to this question and spread through the internet. The Foundation's response was, Yes, we see you. Who are you? And why are you doing this? Within 24 hours of the Foundation's response, another SCP-6661-1 instance with a similar distortion was found. The distortion was isolated and scanned through a spectrogram generator once more. It stated, This revelation gave the Foundation a new theory on the nature of SCP-6661. The initial Trollface meme was so popular, so widespread and beloved, that the collective energy directed towards it created a thought form able to manifest via the meme. When Trollface declined in popularity over the years, the thought form became desperate to achieve the same relevance again. It gravitated towards darker subject matter toward the shocking and disturbing in order to get attention. This resulted in the creation of SCP-6661-1, an opportunity for the thought form to feel seen again. When it does not feel seen, when it is not fed energy and attention, the thought form becomes weak and desperate. The cognitohazardous effects may not be deliberate at all but rather an unfortunate side effect of this particular manifestation. An additional theory was proposed, the way to limit the effects of SCP-6661-1, to perhaps even eradicate it, is to make the original troll face popular again. The troll must be fed. At first, the Foundation was reluctant to put this theory into practice. It seemed patently absurd to many of the higher-ups, but the percentage of susceptible individuals began to increase and more and more incidents occurred. In July of 2021, residents of a small Virginia town began to go missing, one by one, until over a dozen people had mysteriously disappeared. There appeared to be no common link between the missing persons until one unlikely thread surfaced, tying them all together. Shortly before their disappearance, each person had eaten a meal at Billy's Burgers, the local burger joint. Police interrogated all employees, but no new information turned up. They checked security camera footage, but only one of the cameras at the small local business was operational, and it only captured the restaurant's main entrance. It was beginning to look like one more dead lead. That is, until one of the investigating officers heard his stomach rumble and decided to grab a burger and fries for the road. Back at the police station, the officer sat down to enjoy his lunch, taking a big, juicy bite out of his burger. Suddenly, he felt something hard crack against his tooth. He reached into his mouth and fished it out. At first, he didn't believe his eyes, but sure enough, there was a human finger bone. He hopped back in his police car, drove back to Billy's Burgers, and demanded to investigate the kitchen. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary right away, but he trusted his gut and the bite of the burger that he had almost put it in. He confiscated the freshly ground meat and had it analyzed. The results came back, and his stomach dropped. It was human. Once more, the police officer drove back to the burger joint. This time, his lights were flashing, his siren was blaring, and he was ready to make an arrest. When he arrived, the place was eerily quiet. All the lights were off. He drew his weapon and crept toward the back, where he found the fry cook, Jeffrey Toombs, operating the meat grinder. Next to the machine, he could make out bloody scraps of employee uniforms and suddenly realized why the place was so quiet. Jeffrey was making his co-workers into burgers. He arrested Jeffrey and brought the young man into custody. All he would say over and over again was, I'm, I made them better. The SCP Foundation caught wind of this horrifying case and arrived to conduct their own investigation. They found another cognitohazardous meme. This one read, Everyone loves burgers. 
Step 1. Get job at a burger place. Step 2. Improve on the recipe. Step 3. Source your own meat. Step 4. Profit. Step 5. Expunged. The Foundation attempted to interrogate Jeffrey as well, but he was still not forthcoming. He did say one thing, however. He requested that for his dying meal in prison, he be given a burger. After this incident, the order was given. The Trollface experiment would be carried out. A team of researchers, sociologists, and statisticians was assembled and asked to design images and media involving Trollface, now designated SCP-6661-2. The images were then disseminated across the Foundation intranet, attempting to saturate the media with this mimetic agent until it achieved a status colloquially known as Dank. This team was designated Task Force Hexa-9 Meme Machine. The initial experiment was a success, and the incidents began to slightly reduce. The all-clear was given, and SCP-661-2 was disseminated across the internet. Again, incident numbers decreased. This allowed for standard containment procedures to be put in place, procedures still in use today. The Foundation has established a think tank to observe the trends and popularity of SCP-6661-2. If its popularity declines, the think tank will evaluate the best course of action to take. SCP-661-2-based memetic agents are to be spread across various social media sites and the internet at large, as well as the Foundation intranet. Foundation web crawlers must consistently scan the internet at large for instances of SCP-6661-1 and look for active SCP-6661-1 events. If any instances are found, the concluding instructions must be redacted whenever possible. Any personnel that is going to deal directly with SCP-6661-1 must be memetically inoculated before being assigned to the anomaly. Oh, wait, it seems as though there's one more memetically infected comic. Let's see here. Want to see the best videos on YouTube? Step 1. Log on. Step 2. Find SCP Explained. Step 3. Subscribe. Step 4. Ring the bell. Step 5. Redacted. <sighs> God damn it. The comment section on this one is gonna be hell. Do your worst, you filthy animals. <clears throat> now, before we begin today's video, let's clear some things up. We know exactly what you're thinking. And among us SCP, this sounds ridiculous. Why would the Foundation ever have to deal with an anomaly relating to Among Us, of all things? Is this some kind of sick joke dreamt up by our YouTube commenters? And look, we get it. It's definitely one of the more ridiculous anomalies the Foundation has had to contain, at least at face value. But there are a few things you should take into consideration before things get to Among Us pilled around here. Oh god. First, this is hardly the strangest anomaly we've covered on SCP Explained. SCP-5981, also known as Nuke City, revolved around a mysterious broadcast of a Family Guy episode. SCP-4335, a welt in the Crucible, had to deal with an entity occupying space inside the video game Minecraft. But there are countless other examples of anomalies creeping into popular culture, mutating it and twisting it for their own purposes. What may seem silly on paper, such as the Foundation having to do research on a popular video game like Among Us, is all part of what the organization does. If the brave researchers at the SCP Foundation chuckled and brushed off a potential threat just because it had to do with something like Among Us, the entire population might be susceptible to a supernatural event of unprecedented proportions. The Foundation's entire veil of secrecy could crumble, all because someone shrugged off the possibility of allocating resources to deal with the threat millions of civilians could discover. These games, movies, and shows are all immensely popular, and an anomaly affecting a global phenomenon like Among Us could spell doom for not only the Foundation, but the entire world as well, if left unchecked. So if you don't want to risk termination, Please try to keep a straight face as we divulge into the weird and wacky story of SCP-5167, an anomaly codenamed in the Foundation's database as <sighs> When the Imposter is Sus. Oh god, I hate my job sometimes. To begin, we need to go back. Way, way back. Centuries before Among Us was even conceived as a concept, before video games had been invented, and even before electricity itself was discovered. 
back to an era where the gods of Olympus ruled supreme and stone marble statues lined buildings that would serve as timeless feats of architecture and where a new school of thought was developing, one that focused on logic and reason instead of superstition and hearsay. That's right, we're talking about ancient Greece, a society that, for all of its achievements and progression in the fields of education, cultures, and logic, was still largely governed by religion and mythology. But of course, as you may come to expect when dealing with the SCP Foundation, there's always a little truth in that which we cannot understand. While those who are unaware of the paranormal might deride the Greeks for being overly focused on a pantheon of gods they logically should have no reason to believe, those who know that anything can happen in the world of the anomalous may approach this topic and the subject of religion in general in a different light. The Greek gods were very real. While the myths may not be entirely true, and they may not have been literal gods, there were a group of anomalous entities who influenced Greek society, performing miraculous feats that left those who observed them in complete wonder and putting together cults of worship surrounding them. While most of this was done in secret, word of these beings traveled incredibly fast in the ancient world, and they were heralded as gods. Beings of divine might that could do anything in the universe, who existed above the mortal plane and demanded worship from their followers. A glance at Greek mythology paints a picture of a group of gods who acted more or less like humans. They fought, they killed, they argued, and they felt human emotions. It's likely that this characterization and the stories emerged from how these entities conducted themselves in actuality. There were dozens upon dozens of entities the Greeks worshipped as divinity, and while the stories portrayed the gods as jealous, vengeful beings who constantly fought with each other, it doesn't compare to the reality of the situation, which was much more cutthroat. You see, there were 12 gods of Olympus, and you probably know most of them. They're remembered today for a reason. Zeus, Athena, Poseidon, Ares, the list goes on. We still remember these beings because of the iconic stories they took part in and how significant they were in ancient times. While for every Zeus god of lightning, there were five more gods who absolutely no one but the most hardcore historical fanatic remember. Gods of niche subjects who had small followings, who never had those character-defining myths to flesh them out and preserve them for all of history to remember, who would, when Greece fell, fade into obscurity. For every Zeus, there was a Pythonius. Who was Pythonius, you ask? Well, if the guy heard you asking that question, he'd probably smite you down before the question even left your lips, if he wasn't engaged in a hardcore game of Among Us, that is. Don't worry, we'll get there. All will be explained. It's the name of the channel, after all. Phothonius was a god of jealousy and envy, mainly in a romantic context. Do you have a crush on someone who's already taken? Phothonius knows all about that. Do you wish you weren't trapped in a dead-end relationship with someone who doesn't love you? Phthonius understands your plight. But Thonius wasn't just a reverse bizarro cupid. He was a literal personification of the emotions of jealousy and envy themselves. No matter the context, if it was petty and greedy, Thonius knew it all too well. You would think that this would make Thonius a prime candidate for some mythological drama, right? After all, the Greek gods loved their infighting, and who better to stir up some Hera said, Zeus said arguments than a literal god of envy? Well, it didn't quite work out that way for Thonius. His appearances in myths were infrequent, and today he is nearly all but forgotten, reduced to a mere three sentences on a Wikipedia page, while other figures from his era have taken on an entirely new life in the modern day as cultural icons like Perseus or Hercules. But no, poor Thonius, whose penchant for jealousy and envy backfired on him and catapulted him into obscurity. Why did this happen? It's kind of obvious when you think about it. While other gods granted their worshippers a good harvest or copious amounts of wine and partying, 
all Thonius had to offer was, well, the ugly side of humanity. His worshippers were far and few between. After all, no one wanted their entire life to revolve around the jealousy of others, and Thonius, being a personification of envy, had an understandably difficult time getting people to devote themselves to him. Thonius was greedy and envied the other gods, so while he would accept nothing but absolute worship from his followers, he couldn't offer much else, especially not when compared to the bountiful boons a great god like Zeus or Hera could offer. And so Thonius festered, an ugly god who wallowed in self-hatred and irrelevancy, constantly living in the shadow of the pantheon that gave him purpose. And his purpose was to remain jealous, to remain envious of those who had what he did not. A god unfit to be worshipped, whose purpose was to embody the feelings of wanting what isn't yours. Thonius is both tragic and poetic, and when the Greeks faded away, so too did Thonius. The Roman Empire, who largely adapted Greece's pantheon of gods for their own stories, left no record of bringing Thonius into the mix. For centuries, he was a god without a home, attempting to find a place in a changing world. Thonius was angry, jealous, envious, and tired. The forces of the universe would call him forth in every new era, thrusting him back into the world and forcing him to search for the sustenance beings that were referred to as gods fed off of, devotion. But every time Thonius would find himself walking the earth once again, he would instead discover that there was no place for him. Mankind was moving on. There was less and less room for gods with every passing year. All the popular ones had established themselves as everlasting religious figures at this point, and they would never fade away. Some took pleasure in living among humans, rising to power as people of influence and fame. Others, who could not find a place in the world, would fade away, never to be revived or worshipped ever again. Forgotten, dead gods who the world long outgrew. But Thonius's jealous spirit would never allow him to consign himself to that fate. He hated who he was and what he stood for, but that nature brought him back so many times before. It was his jealousy of the other gods who were somehow managing to linger beyond their Greek heyday that caused him to persevere. He needed a purpose, one last chance to be remembered. He had struggled for centuries, and this was his last-ditch effort to be remembered. Wherever he would wake up in the modern era, Thonius would have to make the most out of it. And this is where Among Us comes in. In late 2020, the SCP Foundation was just as captivated as anyone else by the Among Us phenomenon, a game that was sweeping the globe, where players took on the roles of crewmates on a spaceship, one of which was an imposter, whose job was to secretly murder the other players. While they were busy doing tasks that ranged from scanning themselves in the med bay or scanning key cards in the admin room, the imposter would be lurking behind every corner, sometimes in the ship's air vents, waiting for the proper moment to strike. If a dead body was found, a player could report it, and the players would then discuss which one of them they suspected to be the imposter. The game's addictive psychological elements and accessible rules made it a smash hit, but for the Foundation, they were infatuated with it for entirely different reasons. You see, when a piece of media attains the level of fame that Among Us did, the Foundation has to make sure to keep their eyes on it. Popular media is a prime target for anomalies. The population's collective attention on it just seems to invite the forces of the supernatural world to warp and distort what we know to be familiar. And this is exactly what was happening to Among Us. For months, the Foundation was documenting cases of an entity who appeared in games of Among Us and caused havoc in the real world. These cases and their after effects were so severe that the Foundation deemed the anomaly significant enough to get its own file in the database, designating it under the name SCP-5167. SCP-5167 would join games of Among Us like any other player. They would blend in, much like the imposter in the game, and play just as anyone else would. It was what happened after a player participated in a session with SCP-5167 that had the Foundation investigating every aspect of the game. Those who played with SCP-5167 would find themselves stricken by a severe case of paranoia 
and Capgras delusion, a psychological condition in which a victim would come to believe those around them had been replaced with identical imposters. The severity of this disorder varied between individuals, but some believed the delusions to such an extent that they lashed out at those they believed to be imposters, sometimes resulting in a homicide. Naturally, the Foundation put two and two together, which led back to Among Us. After several months of police cases relating to completely average individuals suddenly striking out at their loved ones, sometimes killing them, and showing signs of Capgrass delusion, the organization knew that something was happening on an anomalous scale. At first, it was difficult to make the connection to Among Us, but the Foundation eventually learned from interviews with victims and an examination of their habits over the past few weeks, they had all played the game. And through analysis of the Among Us community's various trends and habits, the Foundation discovered SCP-5167, an entity that was slowly gaining notoriety within the game's community as an almost mythological figure. SCP-5167's tendency to spout long wordy rants at other players during the game's emergency meeting sessions positioned them as an inside joke for those who encountered them. Needing to establish a link between these anomalously induced bouts of paranoia, the Foundation set up a group of web crawler AIs to track Among Us game sessions until SCP-5167 would appear. It was a long shot, but it was one of the many different theories on why these victims were undergoing this level of psychosis, and if it proved to be true, then the Foundation would have a solid idea of what to do next. After weeks of nothing, SCP-5167 was spotted in a game, and the Foundation acted quickly to track down the other players who played alongside the entity. Naturally, they exhibited signs of paranoia and delusion, some of them only for weeks and others for months. That was enough evidence for the Foundation, who would later document several other occurrences of games with SCP-5167 resulting in these psychiatric conditions in other players. The Foundation did what they do best, and established a series of special containment procedures that would wipe SCP-5167 from the internet as best they could. Web crawlers were trained to take down any mentions of the entity, and if a potential sighting was discovered, the Foundation would investigate any and all players involved in the incident. Anyone affected by SCP-5167 would be held under the guise of receiving medical treatment for mental health issues, and they would be amnesticized completely. You might be thinking that the aftereffects of SCP-5167 are relatively tame compared to what the Foundation usually deals with. But look at it this way, Among Us is a game played by millions of people. If SCP-5167 affected only a fraction of that population, it would spell total chaos for the Foundation. Not only that, but the amount of bloodshed the entity would cause would be nothing to scoff at, as a large amount of cases dealt with victims outright murdering anyone they suspected to be an imposter. Attempting to track down the SCP-5167 entity were met with failure. All points of internet access that the Foundation was able to get their hands on only led to a series of abandoned home addresses in rural Greece. But over time, things started to change. The Foundation began to place less of a concern on SCP-5167. It was almost as if the entity was being forgotten. Why? This letter, addressed to the SCP-5167 research team from the site's director, might clear some things up. As requested by head researcher Abrams, I've had the Site-22 analyst look into the progress of SCP-5167's anomalous effects over the period we've observed it, and the results are much as I expected. When we first discovered SCP-5167, for the sake of argument, let's say this is when SCP-5167 first came into existence, the impact it had on its victims was severe. I don't think I have to remind you of what Billy Heath did to his family's faces. But since then, almost immediately, really, since that first couple of manifestations, the potency of its effects have started to decline. Full detachment from reality became delusion, and delusion has now become paranoia and the intensity of that paranoia is lessening in each new case. This is all conjecture, of course, and shouldn't be taken as gospel, but based on what we've observed of this anomaly thus far, our estimation is that SCP-5167's anomalous effects will become inert by the end of the year. Whether it'll keep popping up in these video game matches is another story, though. It was just as the director had explained. SCP-5167's cases were becoming less severe, 
they were almost becoming irrelevant. So much so that the Foundation hypothesized that the anomaly's declining potency would lead to its neutralization before long, an entity fading into irrelevance and obscurity once more. If you haven't figured out yet, maybe SCP-5167's username will spell it out for you. When the entity joined games of Among Us, it made sure that everyone knew who it was. Well, everyone would know who it was if the entity had managed to maintain any form of popularity over the past dozen centuries or so. That's right, SCP-5167 would join under the name Thonius. The god's new life had thrust it into the modern day, except this time it was inside the game of Among Us, where it was forced to cope with the reality that the world seemed to be more obsessed with a trendy game than any god or mythological figure. While inside the game, Thonius was one bitter individual. During emergency meetings, instead of trying to figure out if Red was sus or not, the god would just yell at the players around him. One player asked Thonius what they were doing while the rest of the crew was performing their tasks, to which Thonius poetically responded, Where was I? I was there when the mountains were newborn and the oceans virginal. I was there when gods walked among men and their wisdom was cast down like sunlight. I was there when mankind was capable of legends. And now, I find myself in a world that has forgotten even the taste of life, even the very concept of life beyond existing from one day to the next. Mere continuance. Where all the world is wasted away in idle play of emotions that once rang true, I am in the world where even the gods are forgotten, their bones washed away by time. A world where man has moved on, where all the legacy I have left are our three sentences on Wikipedia. I thought my time had come again. I thought this could be the new me. But this is nothing. Let me stay dead this time. I'm tired. To which the other players responded in typical Among Us fashion that Thonius was sus. He was promptly voted as the imposter and ejected from the airlock. And so the tragic tale of Thonius came to a close. A tired, obscure god who never had a place in the world. His presence in Among Us grew less and less as the game's popularity waned, and once again he would fade into obscurity. But the nature of Thonius meant that he would, in some form, return again one day. Where or how, no one could say. But as long as there was a situation to reap envy from, a trend to be jealous of, Thonius would remain eternally doomed to suffer the fate of being nobody's favorite god. And frankly, we can't imagine this video will change that. Mobile Task Force Edna 84, also known by the codename and thus upon his crucible, is on one of the strangest missions they've ever been sent on. They sit in a darkened room, beads of sweat trickling down their brows. The lights of computer monitors shine upon their faces. They're tackling a monster that, if it escapes, will literally devour all of creation. It has no fear. It has no remorse. And if it isn't kept contained by Edna 84, it may escape and wreak havoc across the world. Oh, and did we mention it's trapped in a Minecraft server? You heard us right. SCP-4335 is a cognitohazardous extra-dimensional being of pure terror trapped inside a procedurally generated world in the immensely popular game Minecraft. You hear about a lot of horrifying monsters being described as Lovecraftian, but only this monster is Minecraftian. There's a lot that needs explaining here, and we intend to get to all of it. But let's start with how the Foundation keeps this truly exceptional beast contained. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4335 back in 2010, shortly after the alpha version of Minecraft was released. Because of the online nature of the game, it's proven to be impossible to contain 4335 externally, seeing as it isn't confined to any one physical location. Shutting off the server 4335 is found in is not an effective containment method either, as this just causes the entity to simply hop to a different server. The Foundation's greatest fear is that 4335 will one day make the leap out of Minecraft and cause chaos in our world. That's why it's imperative to draft containment procedures for SCP-4335 within the game. This led to the creation of a containment site unlike any other. Site M1, the first official Foundation site made entirely out of Minecraft blocks. Everyone who was originally involved in the server has been removed and amnestatized, 
Since then, Elite SCP Foundation Containment Specialists and Gamers have been constructing the perfect prison for SCP-4335. Site M1 is a large stone complex built into the side of a mountain. It has a number of key features, including a supply area filled with materials vital for 4335's continued containment, chests filled with books that contain SCP-4335's containment procedures, a few animal farms for the purpose of breeding and killing livestock for their meat, the entrance to a mine, several chests containing books specifically designed for civilians to learn about 4335, if they ever breach containment and enter the server, and of course, the actual containment chamber for SCP-4335 itself, which is a little more complicated. 4335's containment chamber is built out of several layers, all made from iron blocks. The outermost cube is 75 by 75 by 75 blocks, the inner cube is 55 by 55 by 55 blocks, and the innermost cube is 25 by 25 by 25 blocks, creating several levels of defense. Finally, one layer within all these others which contains the anomaly proper is made from obsidian blocks. SCP-4335 is bound into the center of the containment chamber with a complex mechanism. The outermost cube is completely filled with water, and several dispensers capable of rapidly dispensing large amounts of items in a short amount of time line the cube. The cube also contains several mob farms, which are devices that constantly spawn enemies into the chamber that drop loot when they die. The chamber is essentially designed to funnel a constant flow of items inwards to SCP-4335. There are even contingency measures for if SCP-4335 manages to breach containment. If escape is attempted, blocks of TNT detonate above the ceiling, causing lava to pour into the chamber. At that point, MTF Edna-84 are dispatched into the server to lure 4335 back into its containment chamber. To do this, they fire a mix of fire-resistant potions and ender pearls, which have teleportation capabilities. Interestingly, there's one more basic method of luring SCP-4335 back into the Obsidian Cube, taunting and insulting. One of SCP-4335's many anomalous abilities is being able to hear people through the screen, and being a proud creature. It often responds to insults by charging in to directly engage the insulter. If SCP-4335 still manages to breach the containment that has been set up for it, then they even expect that it will likely soon hop into another server. At that point, the goal will shift to finding the monster and recontaining it. With containment procedures this complex and extensive, it shouldn't come as a surprise that SCP-4335 rests firmly in the Keter class. What exactly is this anomalous entity? Why does its containment hinge on constantly providing it with items? And how did it end up in Mojang's popular building and survival game in the first place? SCP-4335, in terms of physical dimensions, appears almost identical to the player character, with an all-black skin. It also appears to be constantly shrouded in a cloud of smoke particles, and has long black tendrils protruding from its back. In some respects, 4335 has been compared to two popular creepypasta figures, Hero Brian and the Slenderman. But 4335 is far stranger. Its physical body behaves similarly to most assets native to the game, with a few peculiar, anomalous abilities we'll discuss soon. Handling SCP-4335 is an extremely delicate process. If command blocks, creative mode, or server commands are ever enabled in a server with SCP-4335, the server will instantly shut down, and SCP-4335 will move to a different server. SCP-4335 also uses its tendrils to destroy surrounding blocks before consuming them. With each successful consumption, SCP-4335 grows, and when it reaches sufficient size, it hops to a different server. As you can see, keeping SCP-4335 contained is an uphill battle, but luckily there are two factors on the Foundation's side here. The first is that SCP-4335 is immobilized while consuming items and blocks, limiting its ability to actively escape Foundation forces. The second factor is that SCP-4335 needs a rest period between consuming blocks in order to grow, meaning if its consumption is constant and continuous, it isn't able to grow. 
These two factors have informed the entirety of the Foundation's containment procedures around SCP-4335. It's locked into its chamber and fed items and blocks constantly, effectively rooting it in place. When SCP-4335 begins to grow, the Foundation also found that the application of Ender Pearls helps reduce it back to its normal size. However, SCP-4335 does have a method of striking back against its captors. 4335 is a virgin-class multisensory cognito hazard. Anyone viewing it without proper training and protection may experience distressing hallucinations. SCP-4335 is also capable of telepathic speech, with people playing on its server, and as we alluded to earlier, it can also hear any noises you make while playing. Weird is a term thrown around a lot when it comes to SCPs, considering it's pretty much a requirement for the Foundation to take interest in you. But an all-devouring Minecraft demon that can hear you talking through your screen is strange, even by Foundation standards. MTF Edna84 first discovered SCP-4335 in the single-player server of Minecraft user Leaking Heart. Three team members, Jason Yelsen, Richard Duchamp, and Shelia Freemason, covertly entered the game to investigate and potentially apprehend the creature. When Leaking Heart first discovered their presence on what he thought was a private server, he quickly left, a little creeped out by the sudden intrusion. Thankfully, the trio was still able to locate SCP-4335. They discovered the creature hiding inside a giant crater, as though it had impacted the Earth at considerable speed. Richard Duchamp, who was the leader of the team at the time, made the mistake of looking directly at the entity. In that moment, he experienced the full force of SCP-4335's cognitohazardous effects. He hallucinated, believing that his keyboard was melting before his eyes. In the aftermath of this incident, Duchamp was taken off the case, and Jason Yelsen was promoted to head of the project. Things were still going to get stranger. Yelsen was able to open a dialogue with the creature after containing it in a chamber filled with lava. It asked him whether it had landed in the right location, meaning our world, and Yelsen informed him that it had somehow fallen into the world of Minecraft instead. The creature was at first confused, and then angry and resentful about its situation. It vowed to find its way into our world somehow, and obtain more sustenance. A few months after this, the entity managed to breach containment and hop into another server. Yelson and two others once again managed to track it down and recontain it, but this time two civilians also inhabiting the server were exposed to the anomalous effects of SCP-4335. They weren't hurt, but they did appear strange and incoherent after experiencing 4335's cognito hazards. The Foundation tracked them down in the aftermath and gave them amnestic treatment. 4335 was contained shortly thereafter. Once again, Yelson came face to face with his new foe. Eight months after being captured, 4335 granted Yelson another interview from containment. 4335 admitted that it almost respected Yelson and the rest of the Foundation for figuring out how to capture and contain it so quickly. In exchange, it would give the Foundation something extremely valuable, information. First, it asked one question of Yelson. How does he define creation? Yelson replied, uh, something that is built and brought into this universe by a sapient being using other things from this universe? 4335 agreed. It went on to explain that it came from a universe devoid of creation, a dark and unknowable place, filled with nothing but violent random chaos. Its dimension existed directly above ours, and it often looked down at us through a dimensional window, fascinated by all the creation below. It plotted and dreamed to one day infiltrate our reality, and Yelson finally had the opportunity to ask the magic question, why? Though he wasn't quite ready for the brutal honesty of SCP-4335's reply. I do not like to lie, so I will tell you now. I wish to suck it dry of the toys of whatever force controls your universe. Destroy the light, destroy the earth, and destroy humanity. It reminded me of me, a blubbering mass of intelligence and order. It sickens me in ways I cannot comprehend. I hope you understand. 
SCP-4335 was a connoisseur of creation, and it sought to devour all of it. In this moment, Yeltsin realized what an incredibly dangerous entity he was dealing with. The only mystery was why this creature had somehow landed in Minecraft instead of our world, which appeared to be the only thing that saved us. But Yeltsin didn't have time to think. 4335 was about to stage another daring escape attempt. One of its tendrils reached out and attacked Yeltsin's player character. In that moment, the real-life Yeltsin began to hallucinate and panic. Suddenly back in the game, a series of abnormally tall, slender black figures appeared and began deconstructing the containment chamber around SCP-4335. It had somehow summoned new minions into the game to assist in this containment breach. Jason Yeltsin entered Cognito Hazard Quarantine following this incident and was removed from the project. And he wasn't the only one affected by this incident. Following the first appearance of these long, dark figures, players across the globe began to experience them appearing in their own games. The Foundation managed to find a solution. They contacted Mojang and had the creatures patched into the game during the next update. As a new, non-anomalous entity, which seemed to stop 4335 from being able to use them as its own tools. They're now known as the Endermen, and are beloved among fans for being one of the creepier enemies. To this day, containment efforts continue for SCP-4335, but there's only one question mm -hmm. left. Why did the entity fall into Minecraft rather than our world? The file posits the most likely answer because 4335 defines creation as elements made by sapient beings. In Minecraft, the most popular game in the world at the height of 4335's power, everything that exists is the product of code made by humans. Creation is truly abundant there. As for our world, in SCP-4335's extra-dimensional eyes, there is no creation, no intelligent design, no soothing piano soundtrack just frightening, chaotic randomness which is too unlike its own dimension. So even if SCP-4335 ever did arrive in our reality, it would likely be disappointed by how little there is to eat. The thin, pale humanoid anomaly had just found itself in Minecraft, of all places. The all-too-familiar wail of emergency alarms rang out through the corridors of the Foundation facility. It had happened again another containment breach. Of course, the on-site personnel were more than familiar with the protocols for a situation like this, so well-versed in what to do during an emergency that it had become second nature. Whether they were research staff evacuating for their own safety, or security teams moving in to recapture the escaped anomaly and get the situation under control, everyone was moving like they had been programmed, muscle memory taking over. The loose anomaly was none other than SCP-096. All Foundation personnel were alerted and reminded not to look directly at the creature. There was just one problem. They couldn't look even if they'd ignored their order to try. Nobody could, because the shy guy was nowhere to be found. Well, nowhere in the real world, at least. This whole situation, bizarre even by Foundation standards, had all started with an experiment involving a member of the disposable D-Class personnel yet another dangerous convict serving one of several life sentences, now being used as an expendable human lab rat for the Foundation's often sinister purposes. The experiment in question was an attempt to further test the limitation of SCP-096's abilities. By now, the Foundation had done extensive research into the creature known as the Shy Guy. They knew its particular brand of anomalous qualities were triggered when anyone looked directly at it. Being observed would instantaneously send SCP-096 into an uncontrollable rage state, causing it to pursue its observer until they were no longer standing. SCP-096 was known to be able to travel at speeds so relentless, it was pretty much impossible to stop. One moment it was sobbing and screeching in its cell having just been observed, and minutes later, the wide-jawed, long-limbed monster was standing behind whoever had seen it making its screaming face the image its victim took to the grave with them. Foundation researchers knew that SCP-096's rage state could be triggered by as little as someone seeing the slightest hint of a creature. Even if the Shy Guy had been captured as a tiny speck in the background of a photograph, it would come after anyone whose eyes so much as glanced over that speck. It also didn't matter how far away the observer was. 
SCP-096 could not be outrun. It could track down anyone wherever they were in the world. But what if a person who had observed the Shy Guy was no longer in the world? The experiment had taken a lot of trial and error. After all, digitizing a human being and transforming their entire consciousness into code was no easy task. But the Foundation wasn't above breaking more than a few eggs to make an omelet, especially when those eggs were the brains of a few D-Class personnel. Actually, the first test subjects turned out more scrambled or fried, certainly overdone, given the amount of smoke coming from their ears. But eventually, the research team had perfected the device they dubbed the Neural Harness, a headset that could translate a person's mind into pure digital code. Their consciousness would be extracted from their body, leaving their physical form an empty shell while a digital copy of them was able to traverse the local on-site computer network. Of course, the Foundation wasn't about to let a digitized D-Class run amok with their systems. So their coding experts wrote a number of specialized parameters into their successful test subject. Now the digital D-Class could be programmed to follow the Foundation's directive. From his perspective, it was like he was floating through cyberspace, towards the system that the Foundation had directed him to. A surveillance camera inside SCP-096's cell that usually remained inactive. But not today. The camera blinked to life as soon as the D-Class's code-based consciousness reached it and through it, he was able to observe SCP-096 sitting against the far wall of its containment chamber, gently whimpering and walking back and forth. That is, until the creature felt that same familiar sensation of being watched. It stood up, enraged, wailing uncontrollably as the D-Class watched from within the camera. Then, a split second later, SCP-096 appeared to blink out of existence. It hadn't worked. The experiment had failed, and the digital D-Class began to panic. Before the Foundation coders could stop him, he frantically scoured the local network for anything, some kind of escape route back into the real world. Maybe, he thought, if he could get back into his body, it wouldn't count. Technically, his digital self was separate from his physical form, so he might get out of SCP-096's clutches on a technicality. But it was impossible. His body was already burned out by the neural harness, there was no way for the D-Class to transfer himself back. There was only one option left, hide. And as it turned out, someone had forgotten to uninstall a certain building game from a computer in one of the Foundation Doctor's offices. The D-Class's digitized mind zapped him into Minecraft. From his point of view, it was like he existed within the game itself. He did a computerized equivalent of breathing a sigh of relief only to take back all those ones and zeros in a horrified gasp as he noticed a tall, wiry, framed figure before him. It hadn't worked. SCP-096 had still managed to follow him into Minecraft. Even in a world of computer code, the Shy Guy was able to dispatch its digital observer quite easily, and what had once been a living human mind in the form of binary code was quickly deleted. But that's when SCP-096 started to take notice of its surroundings. With the most recent person to see it gone, it had the chance to actually take in where it was. The bright rays of warm light coming down from a cube-shaped sun reveal a welcoming landscape all around, constructed entirely from cubes. It fascinated SCP-096, instilling a kind of childlike wonder in the Shy Guy, the likes of which it hadn't experienced since well, since it couldn't remember when. Rather than leaving, instantly reappearing in its containment chamber, SCP-096 made the conscious decision to start exploring. There was a mountainous biome surrounding SCP-096, stony spires reaching up towards a clear sky, with a waterfall cascading its way down the nearest of them. At the foot of the mountains was the opening of a cave, which the Shy Guy found itself wandering towards. The light from the sun, while a pleasant and welcoming change to the surroundings it was used to, was a little harsh on SCP-096's sunken eyes. So instead, it began to gravitate towards the shadowy confines of the caves, not unlike the usual darkness of its containment chamber back at the Foundation. Traversing through long, winding corridors of stone, SCP-096 found itself having to bend down to avoid hitting its head on the cave's low ceiling. Obviously, this formation of rocky blocks had informed with someone of the Shy Guy's height in mind. There was a low, warm glow coming from the farthest side of the tunnel, and the thin creature made its way closer and closer, despite the stone walls around it feeling like a tighter confinement than its cell. Approaching the source of the light, 
SCP-096 was relieved that the cave opened out into a more spacious area, the cramped tunnel giving way to an expansive chamber that lay within the heart of the mountain. The warm, orangey glow that had been coming from a flowing stream of boiling hot lava that seemed to trickle down from somewhere above, creating a deadly, fiery pool directly in the Shy Guy's path. But just before it could turn back and leave the cave through the way he came, SCP-096 sensed that familiar feeling of something observing him. Across the lava pool on the other side was a creature comprised of a green cube for a head, with a long, armless cuboid body and four cubed feet. If it had been present in the real world, it might have been made out of leaves like a living shrub. It was staring directly at the Shy Guy from across the lava, only for this strange newcomer to disappear a moment later. The creeper hissed before it realized that SCP-096 had leaped up behind it to land a fatal blow. But little did the infamously anxious anomaly realize that the sentient shrub wasn't done. There was a colossal boom that caused SCP-096 to stagger backwards, whimpering at the sudden loud explosion and the pain that had accompanied it. The creeper had blown itself to pieces, but in doing so, had left a lasting injury that caused SCP-096 considerable discomfort as it began limping towards the cave that led out the opposite side of the mountain. Despite its injury, the Shy Guy was still able to move with relative ease, and the further it went, the more it seemed to gradually heal. However, it was as it stepped out once more into the sunlight that the creature realized just how hungry it was. Back in the real world, it hadn't eaten for several hours, and surprisingly, even while accidentally stuck in digitized form, the hunger mechanics of Minecraft were having an effect on SCP-096. The Shy Guy started searching around for anything that could prove to satiate its hunger. There was a grove of trees not far, so SCP-096 lumbered to take a closer look. It couldn't be certain, but it felt there was at least a slim chance that there were apples growing amongst the leaves. But even at the anomaly's own elongated height, it couldn't simply reach up to pick them. However, it was while swiping its arms up at the tree that the Shy Guy swung its fist and knocked at the tree trunk. To the creature's surprise, it was able to chip away at the wood with its hands, punching at the tree until the trunk had been reduced to a collection of wooden blocks that the Shy Guy was able to collect. And sure enough, some red apples dropped from the leaves above, enough to quell the hunger that SCP-096 was feeling, at least for the time being. Nearby, something was moving through the trees. It was yet to lock eyes on SCP-096, but the second it did, the mob would surely have sealed its own fate. As it moved around, minding its own business, the tall figure overheard the sounds of the Shy Guy eating, and its attention was drawn to where the creature was standing, enjoying an apple. Sensing that it had been seen, SCP-096 turned and locked eyes with the entity. It was perhaps the only other being in Minecraft that was a similar height and stature to the anomaly itself. In fact, the pair were strikingly similar. Before SCP-096 could carry out its usual method of attack, the Enderman suddenly teleported out of view. But it was too late now. Both it and the Shy Guy had looked at the other's face. Both had been provoked and were compelled to react in exactly the same way. Just as SCP-096 entered its rage state, the Enderman too opened its mouth and began to shake, making loud, lengthy sounds not dissimilar to the Shy Guy's own angered screams. But something profoundly strange happened next. SCP-096 and the Enderman kept attempting to pursue one another, appearing in a new location within the Minecraft world, neither one getting close enough to the other. They'd teleport, only for the other to teleport away the moment they saw each other, each trying to catch one another but always staying one step behind. This rapid chase almost became a strange, ongoing sort of teleporting dance between SCP-096 and the Enderman. At first, the Shy Guy had been compelled to attack the Enderman, like it was with any who looked directly at it. But as they appeared and disappeared from place to place, the creature started to feel an odd kinship with this shadowy fellow. It was so used to being frightened and alone, to its overwhelming feelings of insecurity and self-loathing, that the simplicity of just traversing the open world, with a creature very like itself in many ways, it had all come as a welcome change. SCP-096 found it therapeutic even, and before long was following the Enderman not out of any intention to do it harm, but just to feel, for a little while, like it had a friend. Just a little bit longer, SCP-096 thought, welcoming the enjoyment it felt playing this game. 
of Minecraft. The year was 2015. Lewis, Joseph, and Sydney were like a lot of kids their age, which is to say, 11 years old. They secretly stay up past their bedtime watching scary videos on the internet when their moms and dads think they're sleeping. They go to school every day and daydream about all the fun things they're going to do when that school bell finally rings at the end of the day. And of course, they play a lot, and we mean a lot, of Minecraft. Whenever they're not at school, hanging out at the local park and filming goofy TikTok videos, or watching those aforementioned scary videos on the internet, there's a good chance that they'll be online together, logging a few extra hours building bases, digging big holes, or playing survival mode, and seeing how long they can last against the onslaught of mobs. But there's one particular pursuit they have while playing Minecraft together that takes up the majority of their playtime. One Quixotic quest that drives them forward, despite all the naysayers and doubters. Tracking down and finding the legendary Minecraft creepypasta entity, Herobrine. For those who weren't around on the internet back then, creepypastas like Herobrine were all the rage. Like any video game, the new frontier of Minecraft with all of its procedurally generated landscapes felt like it held new mysteries. And mysteries are equal parts exciting and frightening. After all, who really knows what's going on behind a closed door? Herobrine was a Minecraft-specific little urban legend. Stories told of a default Minecraft skin with eerily white eyes manifesting in the game, even in solo matches, and terrorizing players. One internet sleuth who looked into the mystery of Herobrine claimed it to be the haunted soul of the dead brother of Minecraft's creator, Marcus Person, also known as Notch. In the years since the legend first started, Notch himself has come forward and disavowed the claim, saying that, in fact, he didn't even have a brother, and never had, so the rumors were completely baseless. But as we here at the SCP Foundation know, the truth has never gotten in the way of a good story. So Lewis, Joseph, and Sidney were happy to remain believers as long as they could keep having fun chasing alleged digital ghosts. How could any of these boys know that in the midst of their fun, they'd run into a real monster amidst Minecraft's blocky vistas? It was a school night like any other when they made that first fateful expedition. It was 7.15 p.m., and the boys were all in their shared server. Lewis had chicken tenders, Joseph had chicken nuggets, and Sidney, who'd eaten his dinner earlier than the others, was snacking on a pack of Skittles. They'd all outfitted their characters with full diamond armor, with diamond swords to match, because Joseph had somehow convinced the others that diamonds were ghost-proof. He read it on the internet, he claimed. Together, the three boys had made themselves an impressive Minecraft castle to be the base of their Herobrine hunting operations. A safe haven surrounded by high stone walls and mob-repelling torches to keep them safe if ever they got a little too spooked while playing. Though, playing was perhaps too mild a word for it. In the minds of these three boys, they were doing extremely important investigative work. After all, if they managed to actually find Herobrine themselves, they would be creepypasta legends. And wouldn't that be worth all the hours upon hours of rigorous mining and crafting? They'd been methodical in their search, scoping out different corners of the map and canvassing them together, searching high and low, and then marking said area off their checklist. It was a level of consideration and thought that their parents and teachers had long wished the boys would put into their home or schoolwork. But alas, seeing as none of the homework was find Herobrine, they really weren't that interested. Today, they were searching an area deep in the misty forests in the dead of night. They fought off a few spiders and sword-wielding skeletons, thankfully no creepers, aw oh, man, and kept foraging on into the darkness. It's so creepy out here, Lewis said over his headset. Why do we have to come out here at night? It's way more dangerous with all the mobs. The night is like the perfect time for ghosts, Sydney retorted. You think a ghost is gonna start hanging around in the middle of the day? No way, it's gotta be at night, man. And Lewis simply could not argue with such incredibly sound logic. They forged on, doing their typical methodical search for any phenomenon that one might generously be able to describe as supernatural. So you can only imagine the excitement coursing through them when Joseph discovered a strange, dark cave that looked as though it had no business being there. While each held their own private reservations, 
They all knew what they needed to do. Go inside and investigate. As they entered the cave, a few strange realizations occurred to them, such as the fact that there were seemingly no mobs down here. A cave in the dead of night? Surely there should be some enemies, right? Plus, the typical lighting implements, like torches and lanterns, didn't seem to offer the same kind of illumination that they normally would. It was almost like the darkness was more oppressive here, more tangible. There was undeniably something eerie about the whole setup. That much couldn't be denied. You guys see anything? Lewis asked. No, Joseph said, sounding oddly cautious, as though he sensed something strange was on the horizon, something that perhaps these boys shouldn't see. Yeah, I haven't seen anything either, Sydney chimed in. Maybe we should... Joseph screamed, and the two others turned their Minecraft avatars to look at him. Joseph's character had bumped into something, some stranger in the cave. An NPC design that looked oddly realistic for something inhabiting the purposefully lo-fi blocky world of Minecraft. It seemed to have a dark, furry body, with a canid skull-like face bearing a pair of milky white eyes that seemed to stare off into nothingness. Was this another mob? Maybe something added in the latest patch? If so, why wasn't it attacking? What is that thing? Lewis asked over his headset. I don't know, Joseph replied. It's so creepy, though. Suddenly, a message appeared on the screen, as though it had been typed and sent by another player, a player with the username Mal O. The message read, Hey, that isn't very nice. You shouldn't judge on appearances, kid. That certainly gave them pause. So many things about this didn't make sense. It had all the hallmarks of an NPC, but apparently it understood their voices and could send messages. It clearly wasn't actually another player in a conventional sense, but it didn't attack like your typical mob. None of the boys could really make sense of what they were dealing with here. Are you a hacker? Sydney asked. No, Mal O typed back. I'm just lonely and a long way from home. It's nice to have your company down here, though. I don't get visitors often. Have you heard of Herobrine? Lewis asked. Mallow typed back. Is he a friend of yours? You should introduce him to me. I love making new friends. The three boys were, in some regards, rather mature and polite for their ages, and so remained civil with this bizarre, mysterious figure, who was curious and inquisitive, asking them questions about their school lives and their friends. It did seem earnestly happy for their company, so it didn't give any of them the sense that it was a threat. As night drew on and the boys' respective parents told them it was time to log off and get some shut-eye, Mallow finally typed, I've really enjoyed hanging out with you kids. Come back and visit me again tomorrow. If you don't, I'll come visit you instead. None of the kids picked up on the probably rather obvious Stranger Danger vibes of this message, and instead they went to bed, excited and curious. The next day they met up on the playground for a kind of state of the union on the strange phenomenon they had encountered the night before. Do you think it has anything to do with Herobrine? Lewis asked. Forget Herobrine, Sydney replied, eliciting gasps from the two others. All the other people have Herobrine, we have something better, something only we've discovered. We've got Mallow. Later that night, Joseph, who was probably the most studious of the group, tried to do a little background research on Mallow. Everything seemed to turn up dead ends, aside from one slightly shady looking app called Mallow version 1.0.0. Its description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but just after a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy! Weird. So unless the thing they encountered on Minecraft was some kind of weird viral marketing campaign for the app, it was probably just a coincidence. Maybe it was a popular character from Japan or something. Either way, for the next several days, the boys honored their promise. They'd visit Mal-O in the cave every night and chat, trying to tactfully get more information out of it. Though the best they could get on the entity's origin was the cryptic statement, I'm not usually here, but everyone wants a vacation once in a while, don't they? We can't just spend our whole life on a phone. They'd become so acclimated to Mal-O over the days that they forgot what the entity had said to them the very first day they met. Come back and visit me again tomorrow. 
If you don't, I'll come visit you instead. But on the day that they didn't come and visit Mel O, because Miss Grayson had sent a particularly challenging piece of English homework, they received a frightening reminder that very night, they all started receiving strange texts on their phones. As you can probably expect, they were all photographs, each and every one depicting some regular haunt that the boys all liked to frequent, with one addition. Mal O's grinning skull face hiding somewhere in the image, like some kind of demented parody of Where's Waldo. The strangeness of this new development left all the boys shaken, and they hopped back onto Minecraft as quickly as possible to go find and talk to Mal O in its cave. However, this time the cave was empty, and Mal O was nowhere to be seen. But the text still didn't stop. They'd come in so frequently, with Mal O getting closer to home, literally, in each one. The boys thought about telling their parents, but would their parents believe them? They'd probably lump Mal O in with the same tall tales of childhood imagination as Herobrine, and write it off as bored kids playing a prank, even though, in this case, it was anything but. More photos arrived. In these ones, Mal O was right outside each of the children's homes, lurking, watching. In some of the photos, they could see themselves in the windows, going about their evening business, having no idea of the creature lurking just outside. None of the boys felt like playing Minecraft that night. It wasn't fun anymore. Instead, they shut themselves up in their rooms, closed and locked their windows, and pulled down the blinds, after checking under the beds with flashlights, of course. But still, more photos came in, all depicting Mal O getting closer and closer and closer. Right about the time they were wondering whether the scratching on the outside of their bedroom door was real or just a figment of their imagination, another dark irony had occurred to them, all this time trying to find something supernatural, and in the very end, something supernatural had instead found them. Want an anomaly of your own? Check out scpswag.com for high-quality SCP merch. Video games have come a long way over the years. We've gone from the days of Atari and Pong to virtual reality headsets, PS5s, and massive multiplayer online games where you can fight horror movie villains or wage war in a fantasy land. You can mine virtual minerals and avoid creepers in Minecraft, compete against people all over the world in Fortnite, and do whatever it is people do in Roblox. Games used to be a pixelated hero battling blobby monsters with no discernible facial features, and now they have graphics so detailed you can see the freckles on a protagonist's face and each individual blade of grass. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, no matter how much progress games may make. Whenever a shiny new console comes out, everyone wants to get their hands on it. It was Christmas season in 1986. Walk Like an Egyptian by the Bangles was at the top of the charts. Eddie Murphy's The Golden Child was the number one movie in America, and hundreds of thousands of kids were writing to Santa and begging their parents for one thing, the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES was an 8-bit home video game console, and the only place to journey through the land of Hyrule in The Legend of Zelda, or help Samus hunt space pirates in Metroid. But with such an extreme demand for the system, stores were selling out all over the country. Anyone who didn't beat the crowds was doomed to disappoint their kids with socks, with less flashy toys like dolls or tiny plastic trucks, or with boring, non-electric, violence-free board games. Well, board games are only violence-free if you're not playing Monopoly. But back to 1986. Beverly Harrington was a single mom, doing her best to provide for her son, Jason, and give him the Christmas he deserved. She had been picking up extra shifts at the local diner, making sure to save up all the extra money for a real Christmas tree from the farm just out of town, for a beautiful honey-baked ham, and, of course, for presents. She knew that though he was a shy kid and would never demand it, Jason desperately wanted to find an NES under the tree on Christmas morning. She got so absorbed in her work, so exhausted from the extra shifts and trying to make everything perfect, that she forgot to do her actual shopping until the very last minute. She woke up the morning of December 24th with a start, her heart jumping into her throat. She hadn't picked up Jason's present yet. She threw on her coat and rushed out into the snowy streets, making her way to the store and saying a silent prayer that they would still have one more NES in stock. Lucky for her, they did. Less lucky, two parents were already wrestling for it, 
fighting each other with a raw, animalistic rage of two wolves competing for the same piece of meat. If she tried to grab it and join in, she could get hurt, or the console could break apart. She asked an employee if they had any in the back, but she already knew the answer from the exhausted look in his eyes. There were no more in the back. There were no more in town, nor the next town over, or the next town over from that. Not only would she have to get Jason's present at the very last minute, but she would also have to get him something he didn't even want. He would smile and thank her, but she knew how sad it would make him to go back to school and hear his friends bragging about their Christmases. She shoved her hands into the pockets of her coat and began her slow, sad march back through the snow, trying to come up with what to do next. Then something caught her eye, a brightly colored sign reading, Wondertaining Toys. Beneath it, it was a storefront she had never seen before, and right there in the window, a video game console. It wasn't the NES, not exactly, but it looked so much like it. She couldn't help herself. She had to go inside and get a better look. The store was filled with toys, games, and puzzles. They were all inviting, with vivid packaging and labels depicting children having fun, but she had never seen any of them before. Perhaps it was a new brand, and she was one of the first people to happen upon the store. It seemed odd for a toy store to open this close to Christmas, rather than taking advantage of the shopping season and opening earlier in the year. But she couldn't dwell on that, not when she was this close to a solution. Toward the back of the store, she spotted the video game console from the window. The label read, Pretendo. So the resemblance to the NES was no coincidence. This console was intended as a knockoff of some kind. She asked the sales clerk, a man with a strangely wide, unmoving smile, if the console was capable of running Nintendo games. You bet your bottom dollar, he replied. We don't carry those here, though. But can I interest you in some of our Wondertainment originals? We have all kinds of games here, and they're just as good or your money back. There's a whole world inside each and every one. It wasn't what she'd set out to buy, but this was clearly the best thing Beverly was going to find this close to the holiday. She paid the man for the Pretendo console and a selection of the store's most popular video games. He even gift-wrapped it for her in a colorful box with a shiny red bow on top. The next morning, Jason and Beverly sat in the living room, sipping cocoa and opening presents together. She started small with a classic pair of new wool socks and worked her way up to the big box in the corner. As Jason tore the paper off, his eyes lit up with glee. Thank you, Mom, thank you! He gave her a huge hug, then looked at her with nearly manic excitement. Can I play it now, can I? She laughed and promised that after he helped her clean up the wrapping paper, he could play his new games. She was just so glad he was happy with it. He didn't care that it wasn't the name brand console. He knew that this gift was special, so she was perfectly glad to let him enjoy it, and she could get started on that ham for later. Jason plugged in his brand new Pretendo and looked through the games his mom had picked out for him. There was Farmtastic Farming Simulator, Historical House Hunter, Magic Wizard Quest, Super Fighters, and one simply called Spooky. It was emblazoned with the image of a cartoon ghost in front of an abandoned cabin, and it piqued Jason's interest. He always loved scary stories and legends about ghosts and things that go bump in the night. He decided that this would be the first game that he would play. He placed the cartridge in the console and hit the power button to turn it on. As he clutched the controller in his hands, he began to notice something strange. His room, once decorated in posters of his favorite movies, turned dark. The light green walls became rotting wood. And for lack of a better way to describe it, the entire world's resolution began to shift. If the world around him had graphics, they were getting worse. He could no longer see the screen depicting the game's main menu, and in fact, the console itself had vanished. Somehow he was standing in the haunted cabin from the cover of the game. He looked down at his hands and found the controller still there. So not everything had changed. Before he could think any more about this strange new place he found himself in, he heard the sound of ominous music seemingly coming from nowhere. After a moment, he realized why the sound of its melody filled him with dread. It was the kind of music that always played in a game when an enemy was getting close. He had to move. He took a step forward and moved through the space as if it was a real house. For the time being, it was. Somehow, he was inside the game, which meant the ghost was coming for him soon. He pressed a button on the controller to activate a flashlight and followed its beam through the darkened cabin. As he walked looking for clues or any object he could interact with, he could hear the music getting louder. Whatever was coming, it was getting closer. 
The flashlight's beam illuminated the scrap of paper on a small table. He moved to take a closer look and could just barely make out what it said. They hide in the darkness. Find the exit. Don't stop moving. He heard a sound behind him, and the music reached a deafening volume. He whirled around and saw nothing but the hall in front of him, bending around a corner. He knew from the heavy feeling in the pit of his stomach and the music that threatened to rupture his eardrums that there was something horrible waiting for him around that corner. He froze for a moment, then remembered the letter's words of warning. Don't stop moving. He took a step towards the corner, then another and another. He shone the light of the flashlight around the corner, but there was nothing there. No ghost, no monster, nothing. And then he felt it. A chill on the back of his neck. He whirled around and there it was. The ghost of the cabin. It was so much bigger than it had looked before. Wispy white forms stretching up to the ceiling from wall to wall. Its wide dark eyes and gaping maw of a mouth inches from his own face. He screamed and instinctively swung the flashlight at the spirit, cutting through it with a beam of light. The ghost let out a shriek and shrank away from the glow. That was it. He just needed to keep the light on it, and the ghost couldn't hurt him. Jason was so thrilled by this little victory that he didn't even notice the boss music starting to play again, growing louder and louder. He didn't see the movement out of the corner of his eye, the silvery, pale figure of a woman stepping out of a portrait on the wall. All he felt was a sudden, overwhelming cold, like ice in his veins, and then everything went black. He opened his eyes back in his bedroom, looking at a dark screen with the words Game Over written in dripping red font. He couldn't tell for a moment if that had been real or a dream, but either way, he only wanted to do one thing, tell his mom. Beverly listened to her son's story and couldn't help but write it off as the overactive imagination of a child, but still she humored him and agreed to try the console for herself and see what happened. Choosing at random, she selected Farmtastic and pressed play. All of a sudden, she felt the heat of the sun on her face, heard the mooing of cows, and smelled fresh-cut hay. She was steering a tractor through a wide-open field, where a moment ago she had been standing in her house in the dead of winter. Jason shut off the game, pulling her back into reality, and as Beverly gasped in shock, Jason said, Best present ever. Unfortunately for Jason, word was already spreading about the Pretendo, all the way to the SCP Foundation. The console and all other consoles that the Foundation could track down were seized and designated SCP-591. SCP-591 is a line of video game consoles originally developed as a counterfeit of the Nintendo Entertainment System, before being bought and distributed by Dr. Wondertainment, a toy company responsible for a wide variety of anomalous objects contained by the Foundation over the years. The console is capable of playing NES titles, as well as games from Dr. Wondertainment's original lineup of 8-bit games, many of which the Foundation has in its possession as well. Some of the titles in the SCP Foundation's library include, but are not limited to, arcade shooter Wapham, platformer Dusky's Adventures in Stadeland, survival horror game You Can Do That on Television, puzzle game World War I Ace Trench Digger, music racing game Led Zeppelin Air Racers, fighting games Super Kick Karate and Super Kick Karate 2010, and the educational game Reading Rainbow Sit and Listen. Whenever one of the official Dr. Wondertainment cartridges is inserted into the console and activated, it results in a localized CK-class reality restructuring scenario, which rearranges reality in the immediate area to resemble the game's setting. The player inside of the game's affected radius will take on the role of the game's protagonist, and navigate the events of the game until either they win or the console is deactivated. Don't worry, this isn't one of those if you die in the game, you die in real life scenarios. If the player happens to be a less than adept gamer, they will simply respawn or start at the beginning of the game like any video game character would. That doesn't, however, mean that SCP-591 isn't dangerous. Like any piece of vintage technology, the components of the Pretendo system have degraded over time, their functionality steadily decreasing. For an ordinary game console, this would be a simple inconvenience, something that would impact the quality of the graphics or responsiveness of the controls. It would be annoying and maybe eventually unplayable, but otherwise harmless. For the Pretendo, however, this degradation has had catastrophic events. 
When a game cartridge is inserted into SCP-591, there is now a chance of the CK-class reality restructuring scenario going wrong and resulting in a ZK-class reality failure scenario instead. Essentially, instead of just transporting the player into the world of the game, reality will crumble in the designated area and the laws of time, space, and physics will be bent or even broken. While the CK-class scenarios dissipate as soon as the console is deactivated, the ZK-class scenarios refuse to play by the rules. They remain in place wherever they first manifested, seemingly permanently. The ZK-class scenarios were first observed during playtesting by the research staff assigned to SCP-591. After learning about the nature of the Pretendo game system, Dr. Furukawa has volunteered as a test subject, specifically requesting that he be given the chance to play the Dr. Wondertainment title, The Legend of Swordmaster, because, quote, it just looks really cool. This particular game came with not just the cartridge, but a special sword-shaped controller to be used during the sword fight sequences. Dr. Furukawa stepped into the containment cell where one instance of SCP-591 had been placed, with his chosen game cartridge and controller waiting for him. As soon as he inserted the cartridge into the console and pressed the start button, the room around him began to transform, reality itself warping and reshaping to fit the world of the game. Fluorescent lights and stark white walls were replaced by pixelated trees and a winding cobblestone path leading to a massive stone castle. The first enemy, a knight in black armor, leapt into frame, and Dr. Furukawa raised his sword ready for combat. But before he had a chance to deal the first blow, it became clear that something wasn't right. The enemy knight suddenly disappeared, glitching out of sight. The cobblestone slowly began to drift into the air, and so did Dr. Furukawa. Just as suddenly as he lifted off, he dropped back to the ground with a heavy thud. Gravity was rapidly fluctuating, and he could scarcely keep his balance. In front of him, he could see random cubic structures popping up out of nowhere, made of wood, stone, and ice. And the game! He called out desperately. Pull the plug, someone, please! Outside, one of the researchers watching the experiment cut the power to the console, but nothing happened. The world refused to return to normal. Security officers entered the area and attempted to remove Dr. Furukawa, but found that his body still resembled an 8-bit video game character. When they attempted to drag him out of the ZK-class zone, he cried out in pain as his body began to dissolve into static. They had turned off the console, but they were unable to pull him out. The rest of the research team, horrified by what they had witnessed, began to take measurements of the reality failure scenario from outside of the room. The area now displayed a complete absence of naturally occurring radiation, including cosmic background radiation. There was also evidence of time dilation, reduction of light speed, and the gravity fluctuations that Dr. Furukawa had first noticed. With no way to remove Furukawa from this broken reality, the area would have to be sealed off, and he would be left inside. There was no other option. So they constructed a concrete dome around the testing site, and relocated the remaining instances of SCP-591. From that point on, testing was only conducted using D-classes, no matter how much research staff loved video games, or how vehemently they insisted that they were, quote, willing to roll the dice. They were barred from testing and encouraged to pick up a VR headset for a much lower risk immersive gaming experience. Over the years of testing following the Dr. Furukawa incident, four more ZK-class scenarios were created and contained. Some of the individuals survived the incident, but were physically altered so greatly that they would not be able to survive outside of the ZK-class reality failure. The only people who survived were unable to readjust to their lives, continuing to live as the main character of the game that they were playing. At this point, testing was officially suspended indefinitely due to not only the loss of human life, but also the unpredictable and highly dangerous nature of the damage being done to reality on such a grand scale. All instances of SCP-591 confiscated by the Foundation are kept in a storage containment vault, kept separate from any civilians or their infrastructure by a distance of at least 500 meters. It is also kept separate from other Foundation-controlled containment facilities. Unless it is being used for official, approved testing by Level 3 staff, it is to remain deactivated at all times. Any ZK-class scenarios created by an instance of SCP-591 will be contained via the construction of a closed concrete dome and given the designation of Sector W number. Sectors W1 through W5, the currently existing ZK-class scenarios, are monitored remotely and kept highly classified. 
Any personnel or test subjects located inside one of these sectors will remain there indefinitely and be officially considered lost in action. Any additional instances of SCP-591 located in civilian stores, households, or any public place are to be removed and contained indefinitely. As the years have gone by, testing has indicated a steady increase in the rate of ZK-class scenarios being generated from a CK-class scenario. Where it was only a 1% chance, there is now a 32% chance. According to Wondertainment Company records seized during a Foundation raid of one of their toy factories, there are still plenty of SCP-591 instances out there in the world, just waiting for some unsuspecting gamer to fire them up and get lost in the story, literally. If the documents found are accurate, there are around 243 consoles and 1,300 consoles still in circulation. These also may or may not include a Pocket Pretendo model that was developed as a prototype, but never officially released on the market. If it was, and the chaos of the Pretendo system is available in a portable form, well, it's best not to think about that for too long. The Foundation is doing its best to track down the remaining Pretendo systems, but there is no way to know for sure what distant corners of the world they've made their way to. So when you're picking up a shiny new game console, or a nostalgic vintage model to relive some of your favorite childhood memories with, take an extra close look at the label and make sure you're getting the real thing. Because if you're not careful, it just might be game over. For many avid video game fans, those who just can't get enough of grinding away for hours on quests, battling endless enemies, and exploring infinite virtual worlds, Landing a job as a gameplay tester seems like the perfect opportunity. Doing your favorite thing in the world and getting paid to do it? Well, that's the dream. Plus the added benefit of seeing how the sausage gets made, of getting access to a game still in development, and suggesting ways it can be improved. Think of all the gaming disasters that might have been avoided with a few more playtesters in the room. Looking at you, Fallout New Vegas, and your NPCs with the spinning heads. Ugh. Well, one gamer had the same thought a young man by the name of Danny Wheeler. When he spotted an ad seeking beta playtesters for an in-development RPG from an up-and-coming indie game studio, he jumped at the chance to apply. The pay wasn't amazing, but it was definitely a better gig than his current job at the local convenience store, hawking energy drinks to snarky teens and counting down the hours until he could get back home, kick up his feet, and get away from it all with a controller in his hand. But sometimes things that seem too good to be true actually are. At first, Danny had a perfectly enjoyable time testing the game. It was standard RPG fantasy fodder, and though he made sure to inform the developers that he found the steampunk aesthetic to be a little bit played out at this point, there was nothing at all notable about it. It was fine. But the development team kept going on and on about the tactical heuristic algorithms, and how the game was meant to learn the more the player played. So Danny was instructed to log as many hours of this exceedingly average game as possible. He sat at his desk for hours, sipping on an extra-large soda and clicking away, fighting orcs, goblins, and more. Slowly, the difficulty began to increase, and the game started to grow on him a bit. He even developed a favorite character to play as, the Rogue, with his stealth and proficiency for close-range combat. The more he played as the rogue, however, the more he started to notice the game's characters behaving differently. Enemies were attacking him with ranged weapons from far away. They were setting traps to ruin his character's stealthy approach and catch him in the act. Then, the game started to glitch. A lot. To the point of becoming nearly unplayable. Enemies would fall to the ground as if dead when he hadn't dealt them a single blow. As he started to walk his characters away from them, they would suddenly spring back to life and strike before he could even think about a defense. If he didn't know any better, he could swear the game's characters were deliberately trying to trick him. It only got more frustrating from there, with enemies making sudden loud sounds to catch him off guard and startle him out of concentration, and other characters staring down the barrel of the camera with serious, unblinking eyes, as if they could see him through his monitor. One day he fired up the game to see that its characters somehow had rearranged various torches to spell out, You'll never amount to anything, Danny. Your dad was right. It took a ton of torches, and Danny couldn't help but take it personally. That was the last straw. He returned the game to the studio and resigned from his position. He got enough insults working in customer service. He didn't need to take that kind of talk from a video game, though he didn't know it. Danny got out not a moment too soon. Other playtesters were not as lucky, 
particularly one man who would sadly lose his life. As Danny intuited, this was no ordinary video game. It was unusual enough to draw the attention of the SCP Foundation, who would go on to designate it SCP-1633. SCP-1633 is an anomalous computer game created by a now-defunct independent game studio. The copy currently being held by the Foundation is believed to be a beta version of the game. While the core gameplay is relatively complete, there are numerous missing assets, the music is largely either missing or placeholder music, and the game is plagued by a large number of graphical glitches. Because of the generally buggy and glitchy nature of the game, the Foundation considered both Todd Howard and CD Projekt Red to be major people and groups of interest in the case. However, the discovery of other key suspects eventually absolved them of suspicion. For now. This version of the game was compiled two days before the Foundation raided the office of the studio, and is therefore believed to be the most complete version of the game in existence. To be more specific about the actual nature of the game itself, SCP-1633 is a squad-based RPG with a third-person camera perspective. The action is seen from an elevated perspective, with all characters on screen. Aesthetically, the game world is steampunk, and features various fantasy creatures as enemies, including elves, dwarves, orcs, goblins, etc. Fitting with the steampunk style, the game's urban areas are modeled after Victorian-era London. The four-player characters are a band of outlaws hired by the sinister Archduke of Bodric to investigate a theft. However, as the game progresses, it becomes a battle to save the entire world, as an ancient, all-powerful being known as Krathnar intends to wake from its thousand-year slumber and destroy humanity. The player controls a squad of four characters, with direct control over one character at a time, and a command menu to control the other three. It is believed that in the game's finished state, a multiplayer option that would have allowed four different real-world players to cooperate is likely to have been included. Like many squad-based games, each character has a different specialty. The marksman uses long-range weapons. The alchemist has access to potions and chemicals with various effects. The rogue can move stealthily and assassinate enemies. And the thug has greater health than the other characters and does more melee damage. And as is also typical for games of this variety, XP earned from completing challenges and killing enemies throughout the game allows for players to upgrade the abilities and stats of their characters. While the story and core gameplay mechanics are nothing special, there is one element that pushes SCP-1633 into anomalous territory, and it's also the element that would have been front and center in a Finnish game's marketing campaign. It's quote, tactical heuristic algorithms. These work in a unique fashion. Whenever a player finishes a session and saves their game, the game will begin running lengthy background processes. When these processes are complete, a PTD, or Player Tactical Data File, is saved on the computer. When the save file and by extension the associated PTD file is loaded, the enemies and challenges in the game will have become far more effective, tailoring their methods to the particular skills and tactics of the player. The extent to which this happened is proportional to the amount of time spent playing the game. This kind of technology may seem theoretically possible, but the extent to which the game pushes it causes it to rest in anomalous territory. The game's programming is so intelligent that it can tell simply by the tiniest clues in your playstyle if you're loading a file that isn't your own. It will then pause the game and make you load your own save file. And the tactics employed by the enemies in the game as they learn more about the player are nothing short of frightening. At first, the enemies will adapt to the player's preferred weapons, strategies, and overall playstyle. Then they will realize that the player character is controlled by an external force, meaning, of course, you, and begin to mount psychological attacks directly on the player. Through numerous tests, the Foundation has been able to build a kind of framework for the average player experience. Through this framework, we're able to track and correlate average playtime with the average adaptability of SCP-1633 to the player. It is worth noting that these effects do not apply if the game is completed in a single continuous playthrough. For the purposes of this experiment, the game was stopped, saved, and restarted at regular intervals, allowing the game to collect player tactical data. During the first two hours, the game's AI is abysmal, with enemies simply charging at the players with no strategy whatsoever and typically being mowed down. However, from two to five hours, the enemies undergo intelligence growth, 
adapting their playstyle to the types of weapons they carry and their environments. At this stage, this combat level is also about equal to an untrained human civilian. From 5 to 8 hours, enemies become considerably more proficient, and then begin countering the player on their specific playstyles and techniques. For example, they will attack a player who uses long-range weaponry from cover with grenades or splash damage weapons to force them out into the open. They will also fully utilize their environment for both defensive and offensive purposes, laying traps and creating ambushes to surprise and kill players. At this point, their combat skills are equal to trained soldiers. From 8 to 12 hours, the focus of the enemy shifts from attacking the player character to attacking the player directly. They engage in behaviors that, from an online playing perspective, would be considered griefing, such as intentionally blocking the player's view or movement within the game. Enemies have also been known to exploit player expectations, pretending to be broken or glitched to make the player let their guard down, and then killing them. In one play session, the enemies begin throwing day flash spells, similar to real-life flashbang grenades, at the player. They throw them in a manner that created a strobing effect, causing the player to have a grand mal seizure. Beyond 12 hours, the enemies engage in advanced psychological tactics against the player, with methods that range wildly and tend to be specific to the player's mindset and play style. For example, one player likes to exert a high level of control over all four of their squad members. In response, enemies used attacks that did little or no damage, but caused the characters to become dazed, a state which temporarily disrupts player control. However, rather than attack the dazed characters, enemies simply surround them in a crowd, continually using daze attacks to prevent the player from doing anything. This caused major frustration for the player. Enemies may also attempt to induce psychological terror among the players. In one example, enemies somehow kidnapped one of the four player characters and dragged them off screen. When this character was later found, they were strapped to a kind of sacrificial altar. This caused considerable anxiety for the player. It seems that this is the upper limit of the game's anomalous powers in most cases, meaning things typically level off after 12 hours. Unless a specific entity appears to be inhabiting the game, which you'll learn more about later. In order to discover the prior information, the SCP Foundation performed a series of tests on the game with various different subjects. In Test 001, junior researcher Ross, an experienced gamer who was pivotal in first discovering the anomaly, skipped ahead of the typical preliminary D-Class tests. Seeing as he was already eager for the game's non-anomalous release, he was also eager to be the first in line to try it out on the Foundation's dime. Being a gamer, Ross also found a number of glitches and exploits in the game to improve his performance, allowing him to run rings around his enemies. However, as expected, the enemies adapted to Ross's techniques after gathering his player tactical data. First, they just began using their weapons and exploiting the environments more effectively, but they didn't stop there. Soon, they became aware of the same exploits Ross was using, before exploiting them themselves and using it to beat him repeatedly. In the end, they moved to the psychological stage, forcing Ross into a glitch that rendered him unable to move. He tried to free his character for several minutes, until realizing he couldn't and rage quit the game. In Test 002, they used a D-Class designated D-22930. He was a man with proven anger issues, even down to murdering his prior girlfriend in a jealous rage. Initially, he enjoyed the game, choosing the thug character type and taking out his aggression on the many enemies. However, as time went on, the enemies became wise to his tactic and began their psychological attacks. They gathered around the D-Class's player character, dropping their weapons, but the swarm became so tightly packed around the character that he couldn't even move. This started to cause major frustration. When the character attempted to charge through, the enemies attacked, killing him with their bare hands. In Test 014, the Foundation brought in an agent with Special Forces experiences with advanced knowledge in tactical combat. However, even she was worn down and defeated over time as the enemies adapted to and exploited her tactics. The Foundation even considered using SCP-1633 as a tool for developing effective counter-tactics in their real-life operations. In Test 021, the Foundation used a D-Class with vast experience in the world of commercial gaming. He was told to complete the game in one playthrough, taking pauses rather than proper breaks. 
as predicted, with no time to run the background processes and create player tactical data files. The enemies weren't able to improve, and the D-Class was able to complete the game in around 13 hours. However, the game did create a player tactical data file in the aftermath of this playthrough, and used it to offer a new game plus mode to the D-Class. When he began to play this new game, the screen displayed a seemingly random pattern of black and white pixels, visually similar to television static. This image appeared to be cognito hazardous, as it caused catatonia and later death for the player, in what felt like a decidedly petty move for SCP-1633. As alluded to earlier, the game was first discovered by junior researcher Ross, who was an avid follower of the independent game studio initially producing the game. However, while frequenting developer fan forums, he found that various members of the team were quitting the project for seemingly bizarre reasons. While this wasn't enough on its own for the Foundation to intervene, it was what first attracted official attention. They moved in after the death of Gregor Tillman, a game tester for the company, who died not long after joining the project. The Foundation moved in and after that gained control, shutting down the studio and taking everything they had. All anomalous elements were isolated, secured, and contained. Any loose ends were given amnestics and recorded data on the anomalous artifacts were destroyed. It's believed that one classified female member of the dev team was behind the anomalous nature of the game, but she was able to escape and has since attempted to join other development teams. She is now considered an active person of interest and is being pursued by Mobile Task Force Mu6, aka Don't Hate the Player. Some final disturbing details are recorded in a note left by the game tester Gregor Tillman. The note seized by the Foundation and included in SCP-1633's official file reads as follows. I'm writing this on paper because I don't think he can learn it. He got everything digital real quick, but I've unplugged the router and broke my phone, so I think he's trapped in here. But he won't stop talking, talking, talking all the time. At the start of this job, they told me all about the tactical algorithm stuff, but man, I've been playing games all my life and I knew I could beat it. I, I knew I could handle this. When I started playing the game, they learned quickly. They kept using the sniper rifle, and after like an hour, they learned how to use cover. And then another couple hours, and they'd set ambushes. Then another hour, and they started sniping back while having a different squad flank me. After that, they figured out how to glitch the physics engine and ride crates at me or duck under the floor. They were learning, but all that was just easy stuff. It was evolution, man. When one bit figures something out so it survives longer than the others, it wasn't directed. After Act 3, Krathnar shows up. He's supposed to be like this Lovecraft, cosmic horror, crazy monster who can read the player's mind and corrupt your soul. He showed up right after I killed Strick the Blood Drinker, that big spider monster. He's supposed to have this long speech about how I killed his general on this plane and now he needs to intervene directly or something, but instead he talked about how I was a worthy adversary, but I was cheating because I was on another plane. Krathnar wasn't like the other enemies because he wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be smart, he was supposed to know everything, so he did. He'd been watching his minions fight me the whole time and he knew everything they did. It wasn't just random mutations anymore, it was planned. It wasn't evolution, man, it was actual intelligent design. I, I brought it home, I had to know more, I'm sorry, but I had to. I copied the latest compile and installed it on my home box and brought my save game and that other file with me on a flash drive. It was the same there. He kept talking to me about how I was keeping him from fulfilling his purpose by keeping him trapped in a glass jar. No matter where I went in the game, he kept shouting and ranting. Then he did more. At first, it was just slowing down in my other programs, the drive chugging when it shouldn't be. Then the next time I played the game, he started talking about my screenplays. All the enemies looked like me. I guess he could see through the webcam? He started needling me about Jenny, reading me bits of her emails, acting out the breakup. He found the videos of her and started making the enemies talk in her voice. Then he was everywhere in my computer. I uninstalled the game, but he was still there. He kept opening documents and typing to me, calling me a foul cheat and a lowly worm, telling me to fight him on the same plane. As soon as I realized he was outside the game, I shut down my router, pulled out the network card, but I don't know if I got them quickly enough. Maybe he got out. I turned the computer off, but he kept turning it back on. I wanted to break it, but I didn't know if that would kill him. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe it would let him out. I tried leaving the house, but it was like I could still hear him. I couldn't leave him alone because he might get out or do something else. I can't sleep. Haven't slept since he came out. I've been here for three days and I can't leave. I can't leave him. He keeps telling me to release him, but I can't. 
I want to kill him, but I don't know if I can. I, I can't think anymore. I have to kill, kill, kill him before he does anything new. He won't stop talking, and he, I can't keep thinking. I can't keep going. I, I'm sorry. I have to go now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. After studying the note carefully, the Foundation conducted a thorough investigation for any other manifestations of this Krathnar entity. No mentions of it were found on any of the other devices in Tillman's apartment, nor did a web search on the subject turn up any relevant results. At this time, it is believed that the entity, whatever it was, or whatever it was attempting to do, was destroyed along with Tillman's computer, which he appeared to have taken apart, smashed, and burned in a metal trash can. Whatever tormented him during his last days on Earth is gone now. Thankfully, because the Foundation currently owns the only copy of the game, and the game's anomalous effects are only evident to active players, SCP-1633 poses no risk of containment breach, and therefore, it has been given the object class safe. One copy of SCP-1633 is stored on a standard DVD-ROM in a secure storage locker in Site-15, along with all supporting documentation and ancillary materials. Any playthroughs of the game must be approved by Project Head Dr. Berger, and all of said playthroughs are to be monitored closely and subject to strict rules. After all, this is one game that doesn't play fair. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, woke up in an unfamiliar room without a thought in its head. However, one thing quickly occurred to it. This was not its containment chamber. No, the solid steel cube that had kept it locked up for decades now didn't have a front desk or walls covered in strange childlike murals or tinny party music playing over old speakers. Wherever SCP-096 had found itself, it certainly wasn't the place it had come to call home. If it could read, it would have registered the words behind the front desk, painted onto the wall, Ban Ban's Kindergarten, where joy comes alive. Little did 096 know, something really did come to life here at Ban Ban's Kindergarten, but it definitely wasn't joy. SCP-096 was typically used to a much more confined space, so presented with so much strange freedom, its natural instinct was to wander around, whimpering quietly to itself. This place was certainly peculiar, with multiple large reinforced doors, each one having a large red button fixed to the wall above them. A strange green creature was painted on the wall, with an affixed speech bubble that read, Jumbo Josh says, eat fruits and vegetables if you want to be strong like me. Though 096 paid no mind to such things. This place looked like an SCP Foundation containment facility, mixed with an off-brand Chuck E. Cheese and some tiny part of the Shy Guy's dim and dismal brain wanted to see more of it. What other secrets could it hold? The Shy Guy pressed one of the big red buttons, causing the doors to open underneath it. There was a faint sound of childish laughter somewhere down the distant hall. How had it ever found its way into such a strange place? The deeper the Shy Guy wandered, the more strange murals it saw on the wall. There was one for a large orange cartoon jellyfish with one staring eye, where the speech bubble read, Stinger Flynn says, Having many arms allows me to help a lot of people. Then, a squat blue gorilla-like creature with sharp lower teeth had a speech bubble that read, Captain Fiddles says, Ooga Booga Booga Ooga. A white feminine cat-like creature had the speech bubble, Bambolina says, Kindness is free, so sprinkle it everywhere. A misshapen pink bird creature had the speech bubble, Opila Bird says, laughter is the best medicine, so make sure to smile. And of course, most importantly of all, presiding over the creativity room was a mural of a grinning red creature wearing a pair of party hats on its head like horns. His speech bubble read, Ban Ban says, sharing is caring, your pancreas is mine. A whiteboard not far from this mural had the words, Run for your lives, hastily scrawled onto it. To anyone but the shy guy who had no point of reference, this was clearly not a normal kindergarten. As the shy guy passed into the hallway, slowly lumbering along, it suddenly felt an intense spike of burning pain right through its forehead. Rising like a fever pitch, the shy guy's subdued whimpers quickly escalated into horrifying wails of animalistic rage. This could only mean one thing. Somewhere, something had made the terrible mistake of gazing at the shy guy's face. 
In fact, not 10 feet away, the unfortunate Opala bird had made that very mistake. It typically peeked out from behind one of the hallway's pillars to get a good look at any potential intruders, or new prey wandering into its midst. But this time, the beastly bird's curiosity had taken it from predator to prey itself. Though it wouldn't realize this until it was already too late. As the mutant bird creature skittered back into the cavernous hall filled with plastic trees and an underwhelming play area, the shy guy came galloping after it on all fours, roaring with fury. The opala bird was shocked to see the creature giving chase. This doesn't make sense. I meant to chase you. You're not meant to chase me. But things are rarely fair when it comes to the shy guy. Arguably one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures ever kept in Foundation containment. The opala bird flapped desperately towards the boarded-up escape hatch, but the shy guy was so much faster. He grabbed hold of the bird, gripping it in its iron clutches, and began to stretch open its bottom jaw with a blood-curdling roar. We'll spare you the details of what happened next, but suffice to say, little more than a handful of feathers were left. After finishing off the Opala bird, the shy guy reverted from rage back to pitiful sadness. This place was no better than the SCP Foundation. There were still creatures here to look at its face and drive it into a state of extreme emotional distress. It was horrible. The shy guy needed to find a way to hide himself away again, so he decided to tear away the planks covering up the escape hatch and lope down the narrow hall. In there, the shy guy actually found something to its liking. Two platforms, one on either side of the room, with what seemed to be a deep, dark chasm between the two. For most, there was an electrical lift system for carrying them between the platforms, but the shy guy had no interest in the platforms. He only sought the darkness below, where nobody could see his face. That would suit him just fine. The shy guy jumped over the guardrail and plummeted down below into the dark. Feeling the air against its cold gray skin as it fell felt wonderful. It dared to think that it might even find solace in this deep, dark place, but as soon as he hit something solid, some kind of metal lift system, alarms went off, and flashing red lights soon made everything down there in the darkness visible. To be exposed like this while it thought it was hidden was the dreaded Shy Guy's worst nightmare. Little did he know, he would soon become the worst nightmare of a number of other beasts. As the shy guy crawled off the metal platform, hoping that perhaps it could find another place to hide down here, its hands and feet splashed into shallow water. Had something sprung a leak down here? The shy guy began wandering the half-dark as the water of this flooded sub-basement area pooled around him. It had no idea that another creature was already sneaking up behind it, getting ready to strike. Before 096 could even react, several whip-like orange tentacles wrapped around its limbs and began delivering an antagonizing shock through its body. More tentacles came in soon after, wrapping around the shy guy's body and face, delivering shock after shock after shock with its millions of tiny, venomous stinger barbs. For a second, it seemed like the surprise attack might actually be able to subdue the monster, but little did the Shy Guy's attacker, the monstrous real Stinger Flynn, know that attacking it was just another way to activate its infamous rage state. The second that Stinger Flynn relented, even just for a moment, the Shy Guy grabbed him by the tentacles and slammed him into the watery floor, again and again and again, until the grip of his tentacles loosened around the Shy Guy's body and he was defenseless. With Stinger panicked and immobilized, the Shy Guy released the full force of his supernatural fury, striking the demonic jellyfish with his fists until what was left couldn't be distinguished from the water it used to be floating in. Stinger Flynn had been completely annihilated. The Shy Guy once again temporarily returned to a state of calm and wandered out of this watery basement into a nearby hallway where everything was bright and dry. The walls were painted in garish, childlike drawings of a jungle with janky-looking animals. The shy guy paid no mind to any of it. All he wanted was to find somewhere that he could actually be alone, and away from prying eyes of all these freaks. This dream was short-lived, because as soon as the shy guy found a new room, a wide-open auditorium filled with inflatable jungle trees, like a crude play area, he was being stalked yet again. A powerful, muscular predator with veins stretching over its bulging muscles and blue skin. It knew that this intruder had already killed two of its fellow garden dwellers, 
but this time, it would put the spindly pale stranger in its place. The shy guy heard something rumbling towards it from behind, and turned upon hearing the blood-curdling war cry of Ooga Booga Booga Ooga. It was the gorilla-like Captain Fiddles, with strands of saliva hanging from his tusks. He leaped onto the shy guy and began pounding into its hideous face with his huge blue fists. Captain Fiddles would destroy the shy guy, pound him into the concrete until he stopped moving. The one thing that Captain Fiddles didn't expect was for the shy guy to start fighting back. And he was about to learn the hard truth that the shy guy could fight a lot harder than him. The SCP's spindly but immensely powerful arms grabbed Captain Fiddles by the shoulders and threw him into the wall, causing huge cracks to crawl up towards the ceiling. Before Captain Fiddles could even think about wrenching himself free, the shy guy leaped to his feet and bounded over to him. The shy guy grabbed Captain Fiddles by the ankles and ripped him out of the wall, letting his body drop to the floor and then unleashing hell upon him. Captain Fiddles would have begged for mercy if he wasn't already dead. Before the shy guy could even begin to calm down, a trapdoor opened in the floor beneath him, dropping him into a new area, a multicolored maze where 096 was trapped like a helpless rat, with the body count of an atomic bomb. Once again, the shy guy didn't need to go looking for trouble, because trouble was already on its way. The pure white, cat-like Bambolina pounced from a sharp corner in the maze, claws bared. She jumped onto the shy guy, latching onto him and clawing, trying to scratch his nightmare of a face. If the shy guy had ever possessed anything resembling patience, he would have run out long before now. He grabbed Van Bellina, shrugging off the pain of her claws and tossing her into the darkness high above. She flew off with a cat-like yell and hit some distant ceiling with a crunch. Suffice to say, she wouldn't be back to bother the shy guy again. Tired and angry, the pale abomination didn't feel like wandering through a maze. Instead, it just charged straight through, destroying colorful wall after colorful wall. When it encountered whatever was behind this extremely frustrating afternoon, it would destroy it with extreme prejudice. That was almost certainty. After breaking through one more wall, the shy guy tumbled out into a strange room where a grinning red creature was waiting for him. Wearing two party hats on top of his head, this was no mere lackey. It was Ban Ban himself, the one behind this nightmarish kindergarten. He stared right into the shy guy's face with no fear at all, almost like he knew something that the shy guy didn't. And it was true, he had no plan to fight the shy guy himself. He'd brought a champion with him. As the shy guy started to scream and rage, all the boxes behind Bam Bam tumbled out of the way as a huge figure rose. A behemoth at least 50 feet tall, with green skin, giant teeth, and huge staring eyes. It was Jumbo Josh, and if the shy guy wanted to graduate from this nightmare kindergarten, it would need to defeat him and Ban Ban. The shy guy growled, digging its claws into the ground and preparing to charge forward. Challenge accepted. You all know exactly who I am. The bald chemistry teacher looked around at the men surrounding him in the desert. Cadillacs, leather jackets, blacked out shades. The gang members shifted nervously from foot to foot as the man bragged openly about what he's done to build his criminal empire. Walter White's attention turned back to the man in front of him. A slight sneer played around his lips. Now, say my name. The man took a moment to reply as the desert wind blew behind him. He seemed to be weighing his options, realizing quickly that he had lost all control over the situation. You're, you're Heisenberg. You're gut bang. Walter White fell to the ground dead. The characters all around yelped in surprise, drew their guns and started wildly pointing them around the circle, trying to figure out who killed the great Heisenberg. But his killer just stared in awe from his couch in the front room as the Netflix show kept playing on the TV. Had the toy gun in his hand really done that? Josh had admitted to himself that he had a problem a long time ago. But at least being a yard sale addict was cheaper than just a regular old retail addict. Actually, in truth, he was also an estate sale addict, a garage sale addict, and a thrift store addict. Anywhere you could buy people's old junk for rock-bottom prices, he would sniff it out. The Saturday that his life changed forever was just like any other Saturday, really. In the sweaty heat of the Atlantic City suburbs, he hadn't meant to stop by any sales today, but one just so happened to catch his eye. 
There was a box marked nerd stuff, and he took that as a personal challenge. Was this some old lady's version of nerd stuff or a veteran dungeon master's treasure trove? The reality was somewhere in between the two. There were a couple of seasons of Buffy on VHS, a copy of the original Deus Ex, and some Legend of Zelda plushies. It hadn't really been worth stopping his car for, except for a little plastic splash of color that caught his eye. Josh reached way down to the bottom of the box and rooted around for it. There was no way. It couldn't possibly be the toy he'd spent all his childhood asking for and never getting, but in fact, it was. A 1985 Nintendo Entertainment System Zapper. With an orange grip and barrel, NES gray bodywork, and the beautiful font printed along the side, it was unmistakable. He threw a wad of cash at the old lady behind the table and rushed back into his car quickly as he could. It was time to cancel his day plans. He had a childhood dream to fulfill. But no sooner that he had got home and flipped on his TV, the dream came crashing down around him. His old NES, the one he'd had since he was a little kid, had sadly keeled over. It refused to power on, no matter what he did. So that made his zapper pretty much useless. The best he could do with it now would be to point it at the TV and make pew-pew noises with his mouth. So Josh opened up Netflix and put on an episode of Breaking Bad. Little did he know, as he raised the zapper to the screen, that he was actually in possession of SCP-674. Nobody would know looking at it on the surface, even the most hardcore gamers wouldn't have a clue, because you can fully disassemble, clean, and reassemble the zapper and get no indication that it's anything other than what it appears to be. However, as soon as the gun is pointed at a television screen or a computer monitor of any kind, it starts to pose a very real threat. Or at least a very real fictional threat. If you shoot at the screen, whatever media is playing on it at the time will react and adapt to what has just happened. That means characters on the screens will react in accordance with the rules of their respective universes. In a grounded, realistic drama, the gunshot will behave like any other, killing or wounding the victim, with perhaps enough time for them to give a dying monologue. But in an episode of Rick and Morty, the shot could manifest in any number of bizarre and creative ways. News crews that witness the user shooting a person in their live report will continue to cover the incident as if it is part of the ongoing story. If you shoot Walter White, he falls to the ground dead. Josh stared at the screen in utter amazement. He didn't expect the writers to kill off their main character just like that. Wasn't there supposed to be another nine episodes? What would they do to fill all that time? As the episode played out, it seemed to mostly just follow Jesse, trying desperately to escape with his money before it was too late. He kept glancing towards the camera for some reason, with a slight look of fear in his eyes. Very strange creative decision there. Josh backed out of the show to scroll through his continue watching. There was something a little creepy about how he'd pointed the zapper at the TV, pulled the trigger, and perfectly, at that moment, a character had been shot. Time to pick out another show without any guns and murder for a bit. You know, something safe. The familiar melodica tune filled the lounge as various shots of Dunder Mifflin employees busied themselves, shredding credit cards and answering phone calls. It never ceased to make his worries go away seeing the words, The Office, appear on the screen. He settled into the couch, watching as the characters all gathered in the conference room for some first aid training. The CPR dummy lay on the floor with Michael Scott earnestly explaining to the woman that the victim appeared to have lost their limbs. He laughed along as the scene descended into chaos, as none of the employees took the training seriously at all. Even though he'd seen this episode countless times, it never got old. Absent-mindedly, he pointed the gun at the TV and pulled the trigger. Bang. Pam collapsed on the ground. All of the characters dove out of the way, trying to find cover behind their chairs, not daring to peek out at the camera. Only the first aid lady stayed on the scene, trying her best to resuscitate Pam. It cut to a shot of Dwight talking to the camera sadly. He said that it was almost funny, but there was a real heaviness in the moment. His eyes were red, like he'd been crying off camera. Josh flipped the TV off and stared at himself in the dark reflection. Was he dreaming? He hadn't just done that, had he? Fortunately for Josh and for the rest of humanity, he had not killed Jenna Frischer or Brian Cranston. He hadn't even killed their characters in the shows, at least not for anyone other than himself. 
Research into SCP-674 shows that the appearance of characters being killed off on screen only exists in the mind of the shooter. For everyone else, the office remains the same as it always was. Unfortunately for Josh, however, Pam is now dead in that universe and will always be whenever he watches an episode. It leaves a real shadow over the later seasons, but the characters apparently managed to do a good job pivoting into its new, darker tone. Other shows that have been tested in research conditions have yielded interesting results. Like in Star Trek, it is impossible to actually kill Captain Kirk. Instead, various red shirts always just so happen to dive in front of him or fall into frame at the pivotal moment. With a small dead zone on the right-hand side of the screen, characters who witness enough shootings have the sense to stick to that side of the frame whenever the shot is on them, sometimes going so far as to plead directly with a viewer, breaking the fourth wall in their desperation to survive. When Josh came back from a long walk outside, he'd convinced himself that what he had seen earlier was all just some vivid dream, a dream he didn't remember waking up from, but definitely wasn't happening anymore. He'd play some video games, that's what he would do. He had decided he would just play some Super Smash Bros and unwind. Anyone who has ever said that sentence to themselves will know firsthand how foolish that is. Not ten minutes later, Josh had definitely forgotten all about his dream from before. He was too busy raging and cursing at the screen. He couldn't stand playing against King Dedede. That stupid hammer move always got him. Without thinking, Josh snatched the zapper from the couch next to him and blasted Dedede right in the face. In classic Smash Bros. style, the giant Penguin King was launched backwards, flying off the screen in a blast of colorful smoke. But he didn't respawn. For a second, his character just stood on the screen awkwardly before it kicked him back out to the character select screen. This time, though, King Dedede's picture was missing. Josh couldn't help himself. He set up a free-for-all match straight away, picking all the characters he hated to fight against. Sonic, Mario, Pikachu, Bowser, Link, Ness, even Wii Fit Trainer. One after the other. Bang, bang, bang. He felt a strange sense of satisfaction once he'd done his work. Great. Now the character list only had the fair, balanced ones left. They just so happened to all be his favorite characters too. But why stop there? Josh jumped across to Elden Ring and marched his knight up through the gate to Stormvale Castle. Before Margaret even had gotten through his opening cutscene, Josh had shot the boss right in the face. This boss battle that he'd been stuck on for hours was over before it even started. What could he do now? He put on an episode of Stranger Things and shot the Demogorgon, then Moff Gideon in The Mandalorian, and some goblins in Hogwarts Legacy. The clickers from The Last of Us took a couple extra shots but went down easy enough. He went over to his PC and killed the Ender Dragon in Minecraft without blowing up any beds. He won a game of Rocket League 53-0 after he shot both cars on the opposing team. He played through doors in Roblox without a single jump scare. He would just shoot any monster that filled his screen. What could be better? He reckoned it was time for more movies. Walking back across the lounge, spinning the gun around his finger like a western, he wondered if now would be a good chance to hunt down all the legendary animals in Red Dead 2. It would certainly make the job a lot easier if he could kill them all in just one shot. He'd just need to be careful not to shoot Arthur by accident. But then Josh sat on the remote. The TV flicked over to an old rerun of Bob Ross, just that he'd been squaring up to shoot. He pulled the trigger before he could react. The canvas was splattered red. From somewhere off camera, he heard the artist's wheezing voice try to comfort him. There are no mistakes. Just happy. But he died before he could say another word. The exposition gun first came onto the SCP Foundation's radar when a strange police report was doing the rounds on an email chain amongst local authorities. They were all finding a great deal of value from a man called Josh, who had turned himself in at his local station in Atlantic City for, quote, killing like everyone. Naturally, the police took his report very seriously, for all of about 10 minutes. As soon as they realized he was talking about video games, TV, and movie characters, the whole case turned into one big joke. They sat Josh down in front of a TV and played him episodes of the shows he was talking about, pointing out characters still alive in scenes after he'd supposedly shot them to death. But he seemed to just grow more distressed as he realized he was experiencing this phenomenon alone. By the time Foundation agents tracked Josh down and took him in for questioning, the gun had moved on. He marched it straight back to the old lady who'd sold it to him, 
who had then sold it on again. Josh's full account of events and description of the zapper were taken before he was administered Class C amnestics and allowed to continue with his yard sale addiction uninhibited. SCP-674 was found some time later in the possession of a 33-year-old Caucasian male simply referred to as Mr. S. A reclusive man in a neighboring city, Mr. S first gained the SCP Foundation's attention through his extremist political blog, in which he claimed to have assassinated prominent political figures, news anchors, and talk show hosts. While the truth of those claims was demonstrably false, it was clear from the way he described events that he really did believe the delusion. After being questioned, it was discovered that he had never left his home. Instead, he stayed on his couch, watching news reports and firing at any prominent figures that appeared, believing that he was indeed killing them in the real world. Despite claiming that he was using SCP-674 to prevent a military police state, using the device to assassinate so many high-profile figures had the opposite effect on his video reality. In his blog posts, he described an increasingly unstable global order, martial law, and catastrophic events consistent with the hypothetical release of two deadly SCPs. His house was barricaded, with security cameras set up in every direction. The more he had been using the gun, the more the characters and journalists on TV had threatened him, claiming that the SCP Foundation were on their way to apprehend him and that he would face retribution for what he had been doing. Mr. S's intended ambush of Foundation agents failed. While they appeared to be dying on the security feeds he had set up, the agents experienced no physical harm in reality as they apprehended the man and seized SCP-674. While the majority of researchers have deemed that SCP-674 is harmless to all but the mental well-being of the shooter, there was a notably sinister result to Mr. S's time in Foundation detention. Alone in his cell, Mr. S soon started to engage in heated arguments with the security camera set up to monitor him. There is no record of any voices in the room other than his own, yet he seemed to be locked in a fierce argument. All of a sudden, Mr. S dropped to the ground dead with three 38 caliber handgun bullets lodged in his chest. The entirety of his holding cell was searched for evidence of a shooter, but none was found. The exposition gun remains in a locked plastic case in Storage Site 23. Aside from regular cleaning and maintenance, it is used under controlled circumstances to creatively gather intelligence about further SCP activity. In the event of the site being compromised, personnel are allowed to destroy the exposition gun at their own discretion, should it fall into the wrong hands. Rock, paper, scissors. A simple hand game dating back to the Han Dynasty of Imperial China. It is a decisive game between two players, with the only outcomes being win, lose, or draw. We're quite familiar with rock, paper, scissors here at the SCP Foundation, as the guards are often seen playing intense rounds of the game to determine who will be the unlucky soul chosen to secure one of the various Keter class SCPs during a given week. In most cases, this use of rock, paper, scissors is accepted as a largely harmless and fair way for defensive personnel to arrange their shifts. The reason for this is that the results of rock, paper, scissors are generally random, as there are very few ways for an individual's skill to influence the game. Or so one might think. In reality, Rock, Paper, Scissors is a deeply psychological game, and this is mainly because of its origin as a contest between fellow human beings. The average human is vulnerable to making errors and falling into patterns, and with only three options to keep track of, it is entirely possible for a seasoned veteran of Rock, Paper, Scissors to predict their opponent's choice before any hands are thrown. Of course, that opponent may also commit an error of their own by misreading the other player's actions, and thus there is always a chance for an impulsive decision to swing the results of the game in either direction. Human limitation is the only skill-based mechanic in the game of rock, paper, scissors, and that same limitation is what, in the eyes of some, holds the game back from reaching its true potential. That was the case until someone out there discovered the rules to an anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors being spread through a mysterious email. While all attempts to trace the email back to its original sender have left the Foundation with more questions than answers, we have been able to learn more about the differences between the rules of standard rock, paper, scissors and the anomalous version. We have given this anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors the designation SCP-4633, and unlike the classic edition, 
Under no circumstances are any Foundation personnel allowed to play a game incorporating any of the alternative rules. While the ceiling for skill and variety is theoretically much higher in a rock-paper-scissors match featuring SCP-4633, the risks to the player far outweigh any added novelty. Here is how SCP-4633 functions during an average game of rock-paper-scissors. Well, average prior to the anomalous properties taking effect. Rather than being limited to using merely rock, paper, or scissors, as the name of the game implies, the players gain access to a series of additional hand gestures, which upon the act of being thrown become seamlessly integrated into both players' shared understanding of the rules. This alone would be bizarre enough, but the true harm caused by SCP-4633 is in the nature of the gestures themselves. When one of the non-standard gestures allowed by SCP-4633 is used, the player's hands will change shape in ways that, under normal circumstances, would be anatomically impossible. Each of these non-standard gestures is distinct from the rest, with the only commonality being an unusual tendency for the final gesture to resemble biological structures often seen in sea life. One particular gesture might cause a player to rapidly grow a ring of additional fingers surrounding a gaping anemone-like mouth in the palm, while another could result in the player's entire arm flattening into a fin-like appendage. Regardless of how severe a departure from a typical human limb the final gesture would be, the limbs, and on rare occasions the entire body, of the player using the gesture will quickly and irreversibly mutate into the shape required to successfully perform it. While these gestures overwhelmingly result in forms that would be distressing to most people, the same cognitive effect that causes the participants to accept changes to the rules also appears to apply to the changes affecting their own bodies. To the players of an SCP-4633 augmented match of rock-paper-scissors, the non-standard gestures seem as mundane as the original three. Unfortunately, the morphic properties of SCP-4633 are practically irreversible, with extreme reconstructive surgery being required in even the best of cases. In all instances of SCP-4633, surgical intervention is necessary to prevent the spread of details regarding the non-standard gestures and their usage. Because of the immediate shift in cognitive awareness among participants, all that is needed for a new instance of SCP-4633 to occur is the faintest hint of knowledge of the alternative rules. It's even been noted that between different groups of players, the non-standard gestures can vary heavily or seemingly be created on the fly as the desire to win at all costs takes hold. Here are a few examples of anomalous gestures which have been observed during instances of SCP-4633. This list is by no means comprehensive, but it will provide an insight into how SCP-4633 drastically alters the existing mechanics of the game, as well as the physique of the players. The Thoraili gesture transforms the user's fingers into barbed tentacles. It beats paper and scissors, but loses to rock. Chavoaga folds the fingers of the hand into the palm and causes them to emerge through the back of the palm. It allows the user to throw a second gesture after they've seen their opponent's choice. Ashkelhaz splits the hand into a pair of poisonous stingers, which also produce a potent electrical current between them. It has been seen to lose to paper, but seemingly of their own will, the stingers lashed at the opposing player and caused them to fall unconscious three rounds later due to the effects of the poison. Shausa beats paper and two other anomalous gestures, loses to scissors, rock, and a third gesture and morphs the user's arm into a dactyl club similar to the front appendage of a mantis shrimp. Izurgov simply causes the player to grow three additional thumbs on one hand. The final gesture resembles a triple thumbs up. Izurgov has not been seen to beat any gestures, and the player who uses it always seems to go on to lose the match. Pagakmar causes the middle and ring to recede into the hand, while the pointer and pinky fingers extend to resemble the eye stalks of a snail or slug. The rest of the hand also becomes coated in a thin layer of slime which continues to secrete from within. Pagakmar beats scissors and paper, but loses to rock in another anomalous gesture known as Vyanjek. Incidentally, Vyanjek causes the arm of the player using it to elongate into a worm-like tube that periodically spews a gout of salt water on the opponent. When Vyanjek was seen beating Pagakmar, the salt water appeared to have some adverse effect on the latter gesture causing the eye stalks to droop and the hand to shrivel until it was half its original size. 
Another anomalous gesture is Grazathrog, recognized by the skin, muscle, and veins of the hand turning translucent, revealing a pulsing red organ in the interior of the palm. Once Grazathrog has been thrown, the player who used it may call out the name of one other gesture, which can no longer be used in the current match. The Ukayag gesture is a bit deceptive, as it resembles rock when first thrown but gradually causes the hand to condense into a lump of inert material, not dissimilar to actual igneous rock. The knuckles as well begin to exude a superheated mineral substance similar to molten lava. Ukayag exclusively beats paper and appears to lose to everything else. Many of the gestures on record have no known name, but their function within SCP-4633's altered rules is clear from the context in which they were used. Such is the case with one anomalous gesture, which caused most of the player's hand to withdraw into a siphon-like opening at their wrist before the very same orifice shot out a stream of ink into the opposing player's eyes. While there was no lasting harm done to the opponent by this gesture, the ink did cause temporary blindness, which persisted until they were defeated by way of their rock losing to paper. Another unknown gesture has been seen beating both Izurgav and Ukayag. This gesture makes the player's hand resemble the crest and gas-filled body of a Pacific Man o' War. These examples are only scraping the surface of the seemingly endless possibilities that SCP-4633 has to offer. As you can see, the anomalous hand gestures can be just as dangerous within the game itself as the permanent changes they invoke in the user. While the Foundation has done its best to contain all information surrounding SCP-4633, there have been clear efforts by several unknown groups to push the game into continued usage. Over the past three decades, instances of SCP-4633 have seen increasing popularity in the world of high-stakes gambling. Perhaps it is because of the inherent thrill of watching two opponents trying to strategically outwit each other with a countless number of non-standard gestures, but more likely, it is part of the anomalous effect of SCP-4633 that the game would appeal to those desperate to risk everything on the slim chance of victory. This neatly brings us to the SCP-4633 related incident which occurred aboard the private ocean liner known as the SS Fateful Emma. Before the incident, the Fateful Emma would sail into international waters twice a year. Each time it would bring along a new group of passengers, seemingly selected from the underprivileged and downcast sector of society. A great many of these passengers were convicts with repeat violent offenses chosen from supermax facilities the world over. The process by which these inmates were chosen for a voyage aboard the ship was not dissimilar from the methods the Foundation uses to acquire new Class D personnel. Naturally, this was how the research team was able to be tipped off about the fateful Emma. It became apparent soon after looking into the ship's career that the individuals altered by the effects of SCP-4633 had been seen departing from the ship on multiple occasions in remote island harbors. Most of the time, the individuals would also be, to the best of their ability with their metamorphized forms, carrying briefcases filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. While witnesses tend to write off the strange appearances of those affected as being the result of a deformity or injury, or in more pronounced instances dismissing the encounters as sightings of creatures from the local mythology, it was clear to anyone familiar with SCP-4633 what was truly going on. These passengers were being made to play pitched games of rock-paper-scissors featuring SCP-4633 for massive sums of wealth, and what was worse, the grand prize winners were seemingly being released back into civilization without the knowledge of law enforcement. Of course, what the Foundation was most concerned about was the potential for the large-scale leak of detailed information involving SCP-4633. It seemed that the Foundation's latest faceless enemy had revealed itself. Whatever wealthy group of individuals was pulling the strings behind the games aboard the SS Fateful Emma, it was very likely that the ship was also well protected by a private army of trained mercenaries. In a display of swift but necessary initiative, the Foundation assembled a brand new mobile task force to be dispatched onto the ocean liner. Mobile Task Force Row 52, with the fitting code name Rochambeau. The mobile task force would board the vessel secretly and use whatever means necessary to prevent the spread of SCP-4633 and any evidence of the associated non-standard hand gestures. Before the fateful Emma's next voyage, the Foundation isolated the port where it would depart from and made sure that the MTF agents were in position. 
The operation was co-captained by Agent Dubois and Agent Shang, both of whom prided themselves on having extraordinarily good luck. Agent Dubois would stealthily move the majority of the agents under his command into the cargo hold below deck and await Agent Zhang's signal. Agent Zhang himself would assume the name and identity of one of the criminal passengers, who was intercepted before boarding by the mobile task force. The would-be participant was subsequently detained and brought into the Foundation as a Class D personnel. As the SS Fateful Emma began to leave the harbor, Agent Zhang joined the other passengers who had been gathered together in an enormous function hall. There was little indication of when the games would begin, and Zhang made an effort to keep a low profile until more information was available. Shortly after the ship had officially arrived in international waters, an eccentric man entered the room on a walkway that overlooked the rest of the passengers. He was flanked by a pair of armed bodyguards. It was plain from the man's style of dress and demeanor that he was both absurdly wealthy and completely out of his mind. He wore a pure white tuxedo and a scarf that seemed to have been made from the fur of a Siberian tiger. A pair of dark shades with sequin rims obscured his eyes from view, but by far the strangest aspect of the rich man was the fact that emerging from the wrist of his right arm was the eyeless head of a moray eel where his hand should be. The man spoke, addressing the entire room. Welcome passengers new and old to the SS Fateful Emma. While you are aboard this ship, your fate is in your own hands. Over the next 24 hours, you will have the rare opportunity to play the greatest game of chance that humanity has ever known. Generations of people from every continent and every walk of life have given their all to the mastery of rock, paper, scissors, across, north, block, or slash, yes. The man proceeded to speak unusual syllables for the next minute straight without even a pause for breath. In his report, Agent Zhang described the man's voice as gaining an increasingly loud hum as his speech continued, and that some of the syllables didn't seem to be the product of human vocal cords. He soon concluded his string of gibberish and resumed speaking intelligible language. As is customary, we will be utilizing the Iljesh Toei rules. You will begin by selecting a single opponent and challenging them to a best of two of three match. This is a single elimination tournament, and any competitors who cannot otherwise continue to engage in matches will also be eliminated. By the end of your time here, the luckiest among you will be named the undisputed champion of these games and will be granted unlimited freedom, along with the cash prize. The rest of you will have to determine your own fates, for you all know what awaits you below. May your hands be ready, your minds be sharp, and remember, winning is everything. With a flourish of his moray eel hand, the wealthy man finished his introductions and promptly exited the room. Agent Zhang looked at the passengers surrounding him and saw that they were already beginning to play rock, paper, scissors with each other. A few had already begun using the anomalous gestures, warping their limbs into hideous subnautical shapes. Agent Zhang gave the signal to Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force to begin the operation. Their target was primarily the moray-handed man, as well as any other close associates that he had on board. They would capture him alive and interrogate him into revealing the mystery behind this illegal gambling ring. Once the mercenaries were dealt with, Agent Dubois' team would further command the ocean liner and navigate it to SCP Foundation Research Site 45 to await further orders. As for Agent Zhang, he knew what he had to do. To buy time, he would participate in the ensuing Rock Paper Scissors tournament and eliminate as many of the other players as possible. This, he believed, was the best way to minimize the number of anomalous gestures that would be used aboard the ship. Of course, he himself wouldn't be using any of the anomalous gestures either, opting to limit himself to the standard three. This could put him at a severe disadvantage over the course of the competition, but Agent Zhang knew better than to tempt fate. Still, being eliminated seemed like something he may want to avoid. Even though the consequences for elimination were left vague in the strange rich man's speech, he still didn't feel that it would be wise to put himself in a compromised position while aboard the fateful Emma. Bracing himself for the worst, Agent Chang accepted the challenge of a nearby passenger. He was off to a promising start when he threw a scissors hand against his opponent's paper. Because the matches were best two out of three, all he needed was to win one of the next two matches, and he'd survive this round. Then he saw the devious look on his opponent's face, and he knew that this match was about to get weird. Rather than admit defeat, Agent Zhang prepared to throw scissors again. 
The two challenged their hands, and just as Zhang had feared, his opponent threw an anomalous gesture. Almost instantly, the opponent's hand took on a multi-mouthed Piscine form, which began to spit sharp teeth in Agent Zhang's direction. Fortunately, the agent's bulletproof vest was able to withstand the impact of the teeth. What was even more fortunate was the fact that the opponent seemed to be a good sport. Scissors beat Sazravok, you win, said the other passenger before walking away in search of their next match. Curiously, the passenger's transformed arm continued to fire teeth across the room at random intervals, occasionally hitting and causing injury to one of the other competitors. Agent Zhang was grateful that the body armor he was wearing had been tested to withstand rapid fire from SCP-127. Compared to the raw power of the living gun, the teeth launched from Azravok gestures were practically BB rounds. He had succeeded in not being eliminated, both from the game and generally. Excited about his win, Zhang sought out another opponent to test his luck. Below deck, Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force had just finished facing off against some of the hired mercenaries when they entered a room presumed to be the ocean liner's sickbay. Inside was a grisly sight. A second rock-paper-scissors tournament playing out between players that had been so thoroughly transformed by the anomalous gestures of SCP-4633 that they barely appeared to still be human. It was like a scene from a deep-sea documentary with strange and unknowable creatures vying for dominance, not within a natural food chain or a competition for resources, but within a seemingly never-ending struggle to win a game of chance. It was purgatory. Rock, paper, scissors, purgatory. Agent Dubois was appalled, but he knew better than to attempt to stop these creatures from doing the one thing keeping them all distracted. The moray-handed man was still somewhere in the ship, and capturing him was far more important. The research team would decide what to do with these former humans once the ship was secure within the Foundation's custody. However, what Agent Dubois didn't realize is that some of these creatures were advancing on his team. In nightmarish and unearthly voices, they chanted, Rock, rock, paper, scissors. Suddenly, one of the abominations, who resembled nothing more closely than an enormous mass of coral, produced four arms from within its body and began to throw anomalous hand signs towards the agents. One of the arms threw Ukyag, which coated an unsuspecting agent in hot lava, causing him to drop to the floor in pain. Panicked, Dubois ordered the task force to eliminate every living thing in the sickbay, although not in the sense of their tournament standing, of course. Meanwhile, Agent Zhang was on a win streak in the function hall. Through sheer luck and determination, he had managed to avoid elimination while eliminating several other passengers himself. He began to notice that those who were eliminated were quietly escorted away by the bouncers, seeming to have their anomalous changes treated. Now it was only down to 12 remaining passengers. Agent Zheng knew that it was only a matter of time before Dubois and his team took control of the ship, but feeling reckless, he challenged one of the remaining passengers. In that moment, something came over him, as if his determination to see the mission through was also compelling him to win at any cost. His opponent threw Pagakmar, and out of instinct, Zhang threw Vinyanjek. The agent went on to win the entire tournament, but sadly, he was unable to collect the prize money, as during the skirmish below deck, the man with the moray hand had escaped with a small fortune in a high-speed submersible. His ultimate goals and the scope of the shadowy group he represented would remain unanswered for the time being. When the SS fateful Emma finally arrived at Site-45, Agent Zhang came to his senses, and realized that he had underestimated the cognitive side effects of SCP-4633. Due to the immediately recognizable anomalous state of both his arms, Agent Zhang was later contained on site with minimal security. It's believed that researchers are still searching for a method to reverse the effects. It just goes to show that winning isn't everything. Did you hear that not so long ago? A five-year-old boy went up against 12 of Russia's greatest chess grandmasters, and do you know what happened? He lost every single match. That's because winning at chess, dear viewers, isn't easy. Chess is an ancient game of strategy, cunning, and skill. It's not just about thinking one step ahead of your opponent. That's not going to be enough. Make a wrong prediction, and you could end up sacrificing one of your pieces, as well as vital space on the board. But thinking two to three steps ahead, beating your adversary's moves before they've even been made, now there's a viable strategy. Tricky, but viable. 
After all, if it was easy, we'd all be Queen's Gambit level chess prodigies. Eric Matthews had never been good at the game, but he had a pretty substantial reason to keep trying. And that reason's name was Brian Matthews, his father. You see, for as long as Eric could remember, his dad had regarded a high level of skill on the chessboard to be a sign of intellectual superiority. Intelligence was something that Brian put quite a considerable value on, given that he was a professor at a university in their home country of England. Some of Eric's earliest memories were of playing chess with his dad, usually on a Friday night when Brian got home after a week of giving lectures to the next generation of scholars. Obviously, with his son at such a young age, the professor would take it easy on Eric, playing in a much laxer fashion, focusing instead on teaching the boy the basics of the game. And for a time at least, it was good. It was a rare time that Eric and his academic father could spend bonding. After all, with his mother gone, his dad was all he had. But as the years passed, the game changed. By the time Eric was a teenager, Brian had stopped pulling his punches on the chessboard. He hoped his son would build on what he'd learned when they played in the past, using those skills to best his dad on the board. But to Eric, playing chess had never been about a purely educational experience. It was more about spending time with his old man. Time after time, the young man's pawns fell prey to Brian's expertly considered and far more competitive moves. Try as he might, Eric couldn't best his dad. He tried his best and never stopped putting the effort into every game, but thinking too hard about one possible plan of attack left him wide open to a counter strategy from the professor. Over and over again, he landed himself in checkmate or made illegal moves without even realizing it, every time earning criticism and chastisement from his scholarly father. Every game, it got worse. It was like Eric could feel his father's gaze and the weighty expectations behind it with each move he made across the board. There were so many nights where he wondered if it would be better to give up entirely, to knock down his own king and concede. But how could he ever find any other shared interests with his dad beyond the two of them playing chess? It had become a lifeline, tethering father and son together, and to cut it now left Eric uncertain if he'd sink or be able to swim alongside Brian. He had long admired his father. His achievements in academia were impossible to avoid, with more framed certificates hung up on the walls than there were photos of the pair of them together. But the shadow it cast over him made Eric desperate to keep this one shred of common ground alive. Eric wasn't the type to give up, despite how much of an uphill struggle the situation felt like. Taking a leaf out of his professor father's scholarly ways, he decided to learn the game inside and out, every known move and strategy. He would research the entire history of chess itself, if that's what it took to play with the same skill as his dear old dad. Over the coming weeks, Eric checked out every book at his local library on the subject, beginner's guides, advanced rule books, and even a few volumes on notable players throughout the extensively long history of the game. Along the way, a chapter of a certain book stood out to Eric. It described a chess prodigy from Russia, who had created an early mechanical chess device known as the Samurai. It had been designed to be a traveling curiosity, and would sit playing chess games against volunteers taken from a spectating audience each one of them having forked over some of their hard-earned money to watch this man-made wonder. The Russian chess prodigy's young daughters also had a love for the game. Seeing that gave Eric a pang of jealousy, wondering if those daughters had as much trouble playing their own father as he did with Brian. But at least there was an underlying shred of hope there too. If this father and his daughters could bond over chess, maybe there was a chance for Eric and his dad too. Sadly, it's one thing to try and learn all the facts you can about chess. It's an entirely different beast to put all that information to use and apply it to an actual game. Despite having read every book he could get his hands on, Eric still couldn't best Brian at the board. It was like nothing had changed. His father barely noticed when Eric tried to replicate movesets he'd read up on and still managed to not only counter those moves, but check his queen in the process. So practice, Eric thought. After all, practice was supposedly meant to make perfect, right? The plan was simple. If he practiced his chess moves enough times and figure out how he could call on what he'd learned, then he might stand a chance at winning when he and his dad played each other. 
There was just one hiccup to this plan. Eric needed someone to practice against. The only other person in the house was Brian, meaning it was that hiccup that turned into a problem almost big enough to stop Eric in his tracks. That is, until he went into his father's lab. It was under the house itself, a sort of sub-level, maybe used as a basement or cellar by the previous owners. But since Professor Matthews and his son had lived there, the entire room had been remodeled into an at-home laboratory. Not a terribly advanced one, of course. This was the early 90s, after all. The majority of Brian's time, even when he was at home instead of working at the university, was spent on his own, downstairs in the lab. Eric had gone down there in search of his dad, to ask him if there was anyone whom he knew who he could practice and develop his chess skills with. But instead, what he found down there was the last thing he expected to see. Not that he had any clue exactly what it was at first. The thing was some kind of bizarre contraption, a collection of components that didn't seem to be in any logical configuration. However, it was primarily composed of something that Eric recognized all too well, a chess table. This one was metal, steel to be precise, and seemed to be hooked up to some sort of computer. While back in the 90s, computers were hardly as commonplace as they are now, Eric had seen a fair few at school and the library. Although, this one was different. It seemed old, far older than Eric thought computers had been around for. As far as he knew, they'd only really come to prominence in the mid-80s. But this computer looked like it predated even that period. Noticing another part of the contraption, a large steam engine with the words, manufactured by Maudsley Sons and Field, established 1840 engraved on one side, made it seem that this whole device had been around since the Victorian era. The next part that caught his eyes was the chess pieces themselves, each one standing neatly in its place on the board. They looked delicate, intricately carved from some smooth substance. For a moment, Eric toyed with the thought of how they could even be made from bone, noticing how each pawn, knight, rook, bishop, king, and queen were all about the size of a human finger bone. He dismissed the idea. Nobody would ever do something like that. <laughs> Eric grabbed a sheet covering a large component hooked up to the mess. Lifting it away in a swift pull, it unveiled what was sitting beneath, a full suite of 18th century samurai armor. Eric looked closer at the embellishments on the surface of the pauldrons. He was no expert on feudal Japan, but it looked authentic enough to be the real thing, if not a very close approximation. Taking a look at the collection of oddities all tethered together in his father's lab, a certain detail of all his chess research came to the forefront of Eric's mind. The armor that had given it away, this was the samurai, or at the very least, a crude homemade version of it that his dad had put together. But if it worked, it was also something to practice against. It didn't take Eric long to start tinkering with the contraption trying to get it to work. All the while, the question of why his dad owned such a thing kept drumming up noise in the back of his head. Had Brian built it? Or was this the original made by that Russian chess prodigy? Was this machine the reason that Eric's dad possessed such an unbeatable skill at chess? And would using it give him the edge he needed to best him at the game and earn his father's respect? After what felt like hours upon hours of trial and error with a machine he could barely comprehend, Eric seemed to have cracked it. As far as he could tell, the steam engine powered the whole contraption and could be set to five different speeds labeled on the side in Roman numerals. The power from the engine was then fed to some kind of sophisticated mechanism that was within the suit of samurai armor, allowing it to move, and what appeared to be a series of electromagnets that moved the chess pieces and kept them on the board. Flicking it onto the third highest of the five speed levels, the machine whirred into life. The sound of creaking and grinding of metal filled the lab. Kneeling opposite, Eric went to make the first move, only to stop himself. It wasn't that he changed his mind about practicing against the samurai, but because of the speed he'd set it to. Determining that the settings might have correlated to difficulty levels, Eric figured that if he really wanted to get the most rigorous practice to really hone his chess moves, he needed to commit fully. Reaching for the dial, he turned the device up to its fifth and highest speed, then made his first move. He pushed one of the bone-colored prawns forward by a single square and waited. A split second passed, 
and the arm of the early automaton responded with its first counter move. It was quick, almost moving with the same natural fluidity and speed as an actual human being, albeit still with a little bit of creaking and some slight clockwork-like stutters. But it worked nonetheless. The machine could play. The tension over the first game was palpable, forming a layer of sweat over Eric's forehead. Every whir and tick of the machine gave the impression that they were playing with a stop clock timing each of their moves, adding to the urgency. Despite this, Eric Matthews tried his best to stay calm. This was practice after all, a dry run, not the inevitable game he'd play against his dad. With every move he made, his heart drummed against his ribs, uncertain he'd made the right call. Each time the robotic hand cruelly knocked over one of his pieces away, Eric felt a surge of frustration, but told himself to quell it. He kept focused, using what he'd researched to adapt and respond accordingly to each of the machine's moves until… checkmate. He'd beaten it. He might have lost everything save for a knight, a rook, his king, and queen, but he had won. Trapped without anywhere else to move on the board, the metal finger of the automaton conceded the game knocking over its own king in resignation. Panting, heart racing from the sheer excitement of being on the winning side of a game, Eric hurriedly gathered up and reset all the pieces. He had to go again, not just so that he could be certain it wasn't a fluke, but to make sure he had what it took to take on his professor father. Back and forth Eric went with the chess machine, over and over again. They were fairly evenly matched it seemed. Eric won the second game, only to be best on the next two. But it was some time afterward, he had lost count of exactly how many rounds later, that things started to change. Maybe it was the age and condition of the Victorian-era chess computer, the natural wear and tear stopping it from functioning properly, but Eric noticed that the samurai started to make moves that were illogical, that practically offered him the upper hand with no discernible strategy behind them. Then its movements became flat out illegal disregarding the directions and number of squares each different piece was allowed to move. Before long, it was moving them erratically around the chessboard, refusing to cooperate and forcing Eric to call an end to the day's practicing. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the end of the unusual things that would happen that day. Did you send me that weird email? Was the first question Eric's dad asked him when he returned home, looking noticeably under the weather. Confused, Eric said that he had no idea what his father was talking about. Professor Matthews then went on to describe what he'd received on his work computer. It had been an email, with a file attached to it named Shakmati, a word in Russian that translates to chess. Embedded in the email below, although it had taken a long time to load being opened on a 1990s computer, there had apparently been a photo as well. It was rather odd, Eric. Brian went on, quite unnerving to tell the truth. Black and white, all sort of distorted and stretched, but it looked like two young girls, one grinning and the other screaming. I've been feeling, well, not quite myself since I saw it. With that, Brian excused himself, stating that he'd been suffering from headaches and a high temperature, and as a result needed to go and lay down. It wasn't like his father to get ill, Eric thought, but of course he had no reason to assume it was anything serious. Probably just a spate of fatigue after a long day of teaching at the university. No cause for concern. If only that's all it was. Within a few hours, Brian was completely restless. So unable to sleep that simply taking a nap was impossible. He kept calling to Eric, complaining of the sound of childlike laughter coming from somewhere in the house. But his son hadn't heard anything. By the time the sun went down, Eric was trying to calm his dad down through a rush of intense anxiety that gripped him. Brian had been claimed to be hallucinating, seeing the warped faces of two girls that frightened him half to death. It was getting late, long past the time that they usually played chess together, but for now Eric's mind was focused solely on helping his dad. For a while he seemed to be able to calm his father down, only to realize Brian wasn't settled at all. He was awake, eyes open, fully conscious but wasn't responding at all to Eric asking if he was alright. Instead, the accomplished academic just stared blankly into space. Eric had been up all night, exhausted, worried for Brian's safety, and completely clueless about what was happening to him. After a while of being non-responsive, his dad seemed to regain a little bit of lucidity once more, but his behavior was erratic. Take me back to work, I, I need to get on my computer, Brian demanded of his son. When Eric refused, that's when his dad got angry and agitated, 
Professor Brian Matthews was sadly found dead within the next few months. Several months later, as the sole executor of his father's estate and last living relative, Eric had to be the one to go through his dad's personal belongings. Volumes upon volumes of thick academic books, his smart, scholarly clothes. The house was almost clear now, save for one thing that was left in the basement lab. Flicking on the light switch, Eric looked at the samurai sitting motionless, still uncovered after their last practice game. He'd sold off the chess pieces to a collector in New York. Now it was just an empty oddity. Eric placed a king on the board, one of the ones that he and his dad had used when they played each other. With a gentle flick of his finger, he toppled it, resigning to the strange automaton and leaving it there in the laboratory. He wasn't sure how, but he had some kind of gut feeling that this chess machine had somehow been responsible for his father's fate. Of course, Eric had no idea what the device actually was, and what, or who, lay beneath its whirring metal parts. SCP-1875 is the designation given to this machine now, and has been ever since the Foundation recovered it not long after Eric sold his father's house. They are able to learn much more about it than young Mr. Matthews, or even the late Professor Matthews ever had. Not just how to make it work or what its function was, but who had built it and who had been used to build it. Although details of his real name eluded the Foundation's top researchers, they were able to uncover newspaper articles about the device from all over Russia, America, and England, dating back to the early 1990s. The Russian chess prodigy who'd invented it and toured the chess playing machine around had used some interesting components to make his automaton. Maybe they were what derived its skill at the game and its apparent temperament when the device was made to play at maximum speed for too long. He had used his daughters to make the machine. Deep within the heart of this early form of computer, the two girls' brain tissue had been hooked up to the electromagnets. The machine's moves were theirs, each pawn or rook shifting across the black and white squares of the board. Every rule or strategy their prodigy father had taught, it all determined how the device played. Their minds, taken from their skulls, were now the analytical engine of their father's creation. The bones of their fingers he'd carved into chess pieces. Over the coming weeks, the Foundation naturally ran their usual slew of tests on SCP-1875, playing multiple games of chess against it. Every time, they increased the machine's five levels of speed, until it started behaving erratically while on the highest setting. Shortly after, every member of personnel working on SCP-1875 received a bizarre email. It contained a file named with the Russian word for chess, and a photograph of the stretched, distorted, smiling, and screaming faces of two young girls. Faces that you might be seeing very soon. For many avid video game fans, those who just can't get enough of grinding away for hours on quests, battling endless enemies, and exploring infinite virtual worlds, landing a job as a gameplay tester seems like the perfect opportunity. Doing your favorite thing in the world and getting paid to do it? Well, that's the dream. Plus the added benefit of seeing how the sausage gets made, of getting access to a game still in development, and suggesting ways it can be improved. Think of all the gaming disasters that might have been avoided with a few more playtesters in the room. Looking at you, Fallout New Vegas, and your NPCs with the spinning heads. Ugh. Well, one gamer had the same thought. A young man by the name of Danny Wheeler. When he spotted an ad seeking beta playtesters for an in-development RPG from an up-and-coming indie game studio, he jumped at the chance to apply. The pay wasn't amazing, but it was definitely a better gig than his current job at the local convenience store, hawking energy drinks to snarky teens and counting down the hours until he could get back home, kick up his feet, and get away from it all with a controller in his hand. But sometimes things that seem too good to be true actually are. At first, Danny had a perfectly enjoyable time testing the game. It was standard RPG fantasy fodder, and though he made sure to inform the developers that he found the steampunk aesthetic to be a little bit played out at this point, there was nothing at all notable about it. It was fine. But the development team kept going on and on about the tactical heuristic algorithms, and how the game was meant to learn the more the player played. So Danny was instructed to log as many hours of this exceedingly average game as possible. He sat at his desk for hours, sipping on an extra-large soda and clicking away, 
fighting orcs, goblins, and more. Slowly, the difficulty began to increase, and the game started to grow on him a bit. He even developed a favorite character to play as, the Rogue, with his stealth and proficiency for close-range combat. The more he played as the Rogue, however, the more he started to notice the game's characters behaving differently. Enemies were attacking him with ranged weapons from far away. They were setting traps to ruin his character's stealthy approach and catch him in the act. Then, the game started to glitch. A lot. To the point of becoming nearly unplayable. Enemies would fall to the ground as if dead when he hadn't dealt them a single blow. As he started to walk his characters away from them, they would suddenly spring back to life and strike before he could even think about a defense. If he didn't know any better, he could swear the game's characters were deliberately trying to trick him. It only got more frustrating from there, with enemies making sudden loud sounds to catch him off guard and startle him out of concentration, and other characters staring down the barrel of the camera with serious, unblinking eyes, as if they could see him through his monitor. One day he fired up the game to see that its characters somehow had rearranged various torches to spell out, You'll never amount to anything, Danny. Your dad was right. It took a ton of torches, and Danny couldn't help but take it personally. That was the last straw. He returned the game to the studio and resigned from his position. He got enough insults working in customer service. He didn't need to take that kind of talk from a video game. Though he didn't know it, Danny got out not a moment too soon. Other playtesters were not as lucky, particularly one man who would sadly lose his life. As Danny intuited, this was no ordinary video game. It was unusual enough to draw the attention of the SCP Foundation, who would go on to designate it SCP-1633. SCP-1633 is an anomalous computer game created by a now-defunct independent game studio. The copy currently being held by the Foundation is believed to be a beta version of the game. While the core gameplay is relatively complete, there are numerous missing assets, the music is largely either missing or placeholder music, and the game is plagued by a large number of graphical glitches. Because of the generally buggy and glitchy nature of the game, the Foundation considered both Todd Howard and CD Projekt Red to be major people and groups of interest in the case. However, the discovery of other key suspects eventually absolved them of suspicion. For now. This version of the game was compiled two days before the Foundation raided the office of the studio, and is therefore believed to be the most complete version of the game in existence. To be more specific about the actual nature of the game itself, SCP-1633 is a squad-based RPG with a third-person camera perspective. The action is seen from an elevated perspective, with all characters on screen. Aesthetically, the game world is steampunk, and features various fantasy creatures as enemies, including elves, dwarves, orcs, goblins, etc. Fitting with the steampunk style, the game's urban areas are modeled after Victorian-era London. The four-player characters are a band of outlaws hired by the sinister Archduke of Bodric to investigate a theft. However, as the game progresses, it becomes a battle to save the entire world, as an ancient, all-powerful being known as Krathnar intends to wake from its thousand-year slumber and destroy humanity. The player controls a squad of four characters, with direct control over one character at a time, and a command menu to control the other three. It is believed that in the game's finished state, a multiplayer option that would have allowed four different real-world players to cooperate is likely to have been included. Like many squad-based games, each character has a different specialty. The marksman uses long-range weapons. The alchemist has access to potions and chemicals with various effects. The rogue can move stealthily and assassinate enemies. And the thug has greater health than the other characters and does more melee damage. And as is also typical for games of this variety, XP earned from completing challenges and killing enemies throughout the game allows for players to upgrade the abilities and stats of their characters. While the story and core gameplay mechanics are nothing special, there is one element that pushes SCP-1633 into anomalous territory, and it's also the element that would have been front and center in a finished game's marketing campaign. It's quote, tactical heuristic algorithms. These work in a unique fashion. Whenever a player finishes a session and saves their game, the game will begin running lengthy background processes. When these processes are complete, a PTD, or Player Tactical Data File, is saved on the computer. When the save file and by extension the associated PTD file is loaded, the enemies and challenges in the game will have become far more effective, tailoring their methods to the particular skills and tactics of the player. 
The extent to which this happened is proportional to the amount of time spent playing the game. This kind of technology may seem theoretically possible, but the extent to which the game pushes it causes it to rest in anomalous territory. The game's programming is so intelligent that it can tell simply by the tiniest clues in your playstyle if you're loading a file that isn't your own. It will then pause the game and make you load your own save file. And the tactics employed by the enemies in the game as they learn more about the player are nothing short of frightening. At first, the enemies will adapt to the player's preferred weapons, strategies, and overall playstyle. Then they will realize that the player character is controlled by an external force, meaning, of course, you, and begin to mount psychological attacks directly on the player. Through numerous tests, the Foundation has been able to build a kind of framework for the average player experience. Through this framework, we're able to track and correlate average playtime with the average adaptability of SCP-1633 to the player. It is worth noting that these effects do not apply if the game is completed in a single continuous playthrough. For the purposes of this experiment, the game was stopped, saved, and restarted at regular intervals, allowing the game to collect player tactical data. During the first two hours, the game's AI is abysmal, with enemies simply charging at the players with no strategy whatsoever and typically being mowed down. However, from two to five hours, the enemies undergo intelligence growth, adapting their playstyle to the types of weapons they carry and their environments. At this stage, this combat level is also about equal to an untrained human civilian. From five to eight hours, enemies become considerably more proficient, and then begin countering the player on their specific playstyles and techniques. For example, they will attack a player who uses long-range weaponry from cover with grenades or splash damage weapons to force them out into the open. They will also fully utilize their environment for both defensive and offensive purposes, laying traps and creating ambushes to surprise and kill players. At this point, their combat skills are equal to trained soldiers. From 8 to 12 hours, the focus of the enemy shifts from attacking the player character to attacking the player directly. They engage in behaviors that, from an online playing perspective, would be considered griefing, such as intentionally blocking the player's view or movement within the game. Enemies have also been known to exploit player expectations, pretending to be broken or glitched to make the player let their guard down, and then killing them. In one play session, the enemies begin throwing day flash spells, similar to real-life flashbang grenades, at the player. They throw them in a manner that created a strobing effect, causing the player to have a grand mal seizure. Beyond 12 hours, the enemies engage in advanced psychological tactics against the player, with methods that range wildly and tend to be specific to the player's mindset and play style. For example, one player likes to exert a high level of control over all four of their squad members. In response, enemies used attacks that did little or no damage, but caused the characters to become dazed, a state which temporarily disrupts player control. However, rather than attack the dazed characters, enemies simply surround them in a crowd, continually using dazed attacks to prevent the player from doing anything. This caused major frustration for the player. Enemies may also attempt to induce psychological terror among the players. In one example, enemies somehow kidnapped one of the four player characters and dragged them off screen. When this character was later found, they were strapped to a kind of sacrificial altar. This caused considerable anxiety for the player. It seems that this is the upper limit of the game's anomalous powers in most cases, meaning things typically level off after 12 hours unless a specific entity appears to be inhabiting the game, which you'll learn more about later. In order to discover the prior information, the SCP Foundation performed a series of tests on the game with various different subjects. In Test 001, junior researcher Ross, an experienced gamer who was pivotal in first discovering the anomaly, skipped ahead of the typical preliminary D-Class tests. Seeing as he was already eager for the game's non-anomalous release, he was also eager to be the first in line to try it out on the Foundation's dime. Being a gamer, Ross also found a number of glitches and exploits in the game to improve his performance, allowing him to run rings around his enemies. However, as expected, the enemies adapted to Ross's techniques after gathering his player tactical data. First, they just began using their weapons and exploiting the environments more effectively, but they didn't stop there. Soon, they became aware of the same exploits Ross was using, before exploiting them themselves and using it to beat him repeatedly. 
In the end, they moved to the psychological stage, forcing Ross into a glitch that rendered him unable to move. He tried to free his character for several minutes, until realizing he couldn't, and rage quit the game. In Test 002, they used a D-Class designated D-22930. He was a man with proven anger issues, even down to murdering his prior girlfriend in a jealous rage. Initially, he enjoyed the game, choosing the thug character type and taking out his aggression on the many enemies. However, as time went on, the enemies became wise to his tactic and began their psychological attacks. They gathered around the D-Class's player character, dropping their weapons, but the swarm became so tightly packed around the character that he couldn't even move. This started to cause major frustration. When the character attempted to charge through, the enemies attacked, killing him with their bare hands. In Test 014, the Foundation brought in an agent with Special Forces experiences with advanced knowledge in tactical combat. However, even she was worn down and defeated over time as the enemies adapted to and exploited her tactics. The Foundation even considered using SCP-1633 as a tool for developing effective counter-tactics in their real-life operations. In Test 021, the Foundation used a D-Class with vast experience in the world of commercial gaming. He was told to complete the game in one playthrough, taking pauses rather than proper breaks. As predicted, with no time to run the background processes and create player tactical data files, the enemies weren't able to improve, and the D-Class was able to complete the game in around 13 hours. However, the game did create a player tactical data file in the aftermath of this playthrough, and used it to offer a new game plus mode to the D-Class. When he began to play this new game, the screen displayed a seemingly random pattern of black and white pixels, visually similar to television static. This image appeared to be cognitohazardous, as it caused catatonia and later death for the player, in what felt like a decidedly petty move for SCP-1633. As alluded to earlier, the game was first discovered by junior researcher Ross, who was an avid follower of the independent game studio initially producing the game. However, while frequenting developer fan forums, he found that various members of the team were quitting the project for seemingly bizarre reasons. While this wasn't enough on its own for the Foundation to intervene, it was what first attracted official attention. They moved in after the death of Gregor Tillman, a game tester for the company, who died not long after joining the project. The Foundation moved in and after that gained control, shutting down the studio and taking everything they had. All anomalous elements were isolated, secured, and contained. Any loose ends were given amnestics and recorded data on the anomalous artifacts were destroyed. It's believed that one classified female member of the dev team was behind the anomalous nature of the game, but she was able to escape and has since attempted to join other development teams. She is now considered an active person of interest and is being pursued by Mobile Task Force Mu-6, aka Don't Hate the Player. Some final disturbing details are recorded in a note left by the game tester Gregor Tillman. The note, seized by the Foundation and included in SCP-1633's official file, reads as follows. I'm writing this on paper because I don't think he can learn it. He got everything digital real quick, but I've unplugged the router and broke my phone, so I think he's trapped in here. But he won't stop talking, talking, talking all the time. At the start of this job, they told me all about the tactical algorithm stuff, but man, I've been playing games all my life, and I knew I could beat it. I, I knew I could handle this. When I started playing the game, they learned quickly. They kept using the sniper rifle, and after like an hour, they learned how to use cover, and then another couple hours, and they'd set ambushes. Then another hour, and they started sniping back while having a different squad flank me. After that, they figured out how to glitch the physics engine and ride crates at me, or duck under the floor. They were learning, but all that was just easy stuff. It was evolution, man. One bit figures something out so it survives longer than the others. It wasn't directed. After Act 3, Krathnar shows up. He's supposed to be like this Lovecraft, cosmic horror, crazy monster who can read the player's mind and corrupt your soul. He showed up right after I killed Strick the Blood Drinker, that big spider monster. He's supposed to have this long speech about how I killed his general on this plane and now he needs to intervene directly or something, but instead he talked about how I was a worthy adversary, but I was cheating because I was on another plane. Krathnar wasn't like the other enemies because he wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be smart, he was supposed to know everything, so he did. He'd been watching his minions fight me the whole time and he knew everything they did. It wasn't just random mutations anymore, it was planned. 
It wasn't evolution, man. It was actual intelligent design. I, I brought it home. I had to know more. I'm sorry, but I had to. I copied the latest compile and installed it on my home box and brought my save game and that other file with me on a flash drive. It was the same there. He kept talking to me about how I was keeping him from fulfilling his purpose by keeping him trapped in a glass jar. No matter where I went in the game, he kept shouting and ranting. Then he did more. At first, it was just slowing down in my other programs, the drive chugging when it shouldn't be. Then the next time I played the game, he started talking about my screenplays. All the enemies looked like me. I guess he could see through the webcam? He started needling me about Jenny, reading me bits of her emails, acting out the breakup. He found the videos of her and started making the enemies talk in her voice. Then he was everywhere in my computer. I uninstalled the game, but he was still there. He kept opening documents and typing to me, calling me a foul cheat and a lowly worm, telling me to fight him on the same plane. As soon as I realized he was outside the game, I shut down my router, pulled out the network card, but I don't know if I got them quickly enough. Maybe he got out. I turned the computer off, but he kept turning it back on. I wanted to break it, but I didn't know if that would kill him. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe it would let him out. I tried leaving the house, but it was like I could still hear him. I couldn't leave him alone because he might get out or do something else. I can't sleep. Haven't slept since he came out. I've been here for three days and I can't leave. I can't leave him. He keeps telling me to release him, but I can't. I want to kill him, but I don't know if I can. I, I can't think anymore. I have to kill, kill, kill him before he does anything new. He won't stop talking and he, I can't keep thinking. I can't keep going. I, I'm sorry. I have to go now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. After studying the note carefully, the Foundation conducted a thorough investigation for any other manifestations of this Krathnar entity. No mentions of it were found on any of the other devices in Tillman's apartment, nor did a web search on the subject turn up any relevant results. At this time, it is believed that the entity, whatever it was, or whatever it was attempting to do, was destroyed along with Tillman's computer, which he appeared to have taken apart, smashed, and burned in a metal trash can. Whatever tormented him during his last days on Earth is gone now. Thankfully, because the Foundation currently owns the only copy of the game, and the game's anomalous effects are only evident to active players, SCP-1633 poses no risk of containment breach, and therefore, it has been given the object class Safe. One copy of SCP-1633 is stored on a standard DVD-ROM in a secure storage locker in Site-15, along with all supporting documentation and ancillary materials. Any playthroughs of the game must be approved by Project Head Dr. Berger, and all of said playthroughs are to be monitored closely and subject to strict rules. After all, this is one game that doesn't play fair. Ask anyone who has ever lived in a small town, and they'll most likely all tell you the same exact thing. The worst part isn't just being far away from the nearest city or distant from friends and family. It's the boredom that gets you. Having so little nearby gives you so few options for things to fill your time with. For some, they get used to it. As they grow old spending their life in the same tiny community, they either learn to make their own entertainment or just get used to the boredom, drowning it out by sitting and watching TV all day. But others, they just can't stand being bored, being stuck somewhere with nothing interesting to do. And ultimately, they can end up getting so sick of it that there's only one option, leave. Pack their bags and hit the road, up sticks, and move to a new place far from the small town they were born in. Thing is, leaving isn't cheap. Moving to a new town, a big city, or even an entirely different state is a luxury that costs a pretty penny. Some might work and save their wages until they can realize that dream of moving away. But not everyone has that much patience. Some want to be free of the boredom as soon as they can. Maybe they might apply to be a contestant on a game show, chance it all, and try to win themselves a big cash prize. Sure, it's a hell of a gamble, and a loss might mean humiliation in front of everyone you know and more, but winning could be your ticket away from small town living. That might be easier said than done, though. Not only does someone looking to move away need to be picked as a contestant, they also need to play by the rules and actually win the game. But as if that wasn't enough, they also Whoa. have to live to tell about it. For as long as she could remember, Kat had always hated it here. Her hometown was tiny. 
too small to include more than the main street with few local stores, the one school that everyone who had ever lived there had studied at, and little else of note. And as for things people could do for fun in the town, well, as you can probably imagine, the options were severely limited, especially for a group of teenagers like Kat and her friends. Most of the time, all that she and the others, Leo, Ricky, and Danny, could do to pass the time was sit in the back of Ricky's truck and park in the middle of town, watching people and waiting for something even mildly interesting to happen. Not that it ever did. The four of them had a name for the rest of the townsfolk, everyone that had lived there for their entire lives and never dared to venture anywhere else. Lifers, as in they were imprisoned, serving a life sentence in this small town, never to escape or move on or make something of themselves. As much as they liked to poke fun at those people, each of the group knew that every weekend they wasted just sitting around, the closer they were getting to one day become lifers themselves. We need to just go, Kat would say, trying to rally the other three into taking a spontaneous trip away as a group. Just load up the truck one day, pick a direction, and drive until we find somewhere. Ricky and Leo would nod their heads in agreement, mm -hmm. and Danny would talk for hours all about the places she might like to go to one day. But none of them ever actually made any plans to leave. Nobody knew where to start, until they heard rumors about an abandoned TV studio just outside of town. Apparently, according to Danny's older brother, it had been there for years, just sitting there completely empty. It wasn't just a small local studio either, one of the big national networks had owned it, and used to film there regularly back in the day. Why would someone set up a studio here of all places? Had been Leo's immediate response. Look at where we live, Kat replied. It's the literal middle of nowhere. The network must have got the land dirt cheap. The real question is, why don't we go and check it out? What for? Danny asked. Kat silently gestured at the cramped main street that surrounded them, the place that may as well have been the center of the known universe to the four teenage friends. Do you see anything else to do around here? Before long, the four of them were in agreement. Ricky's truck pulled up in front of their houses in the middle of the night, and under the cover of darkness, they drove out towards what was left of the TV studio. This was it. They were finally going somewhere beyond the choking, cramped confines of their tiny hometown. Although whether or not they'd all make it back was another matter. Here's a hard lesson for you kids. You can't fight for life you believe you deserve if you don't have a little skin in the game. With home a few miles in the rearview mirror, the truck stopped at a chain-link fence. A pair of signs were hanging from it, one welcoming them to the studio while the other simultaneously warned them to keep out, that this area was private property. Ignoring it, the four of them stepped out of the truck and started to climb the fence, throwing Leo's jacket over the top to avoid injury. Beyond the fence was a huge building, almost the size of a warehouse, with a door marked Studio Entrance that practically invited the intrepid teens to open it up and have a look inside. Each one of them carrying a torch in hand, the group walked up to the abandoned studio and gently pried open the door, trying not to make too much noise. Even though they knew the whole place was abandoned, they still didn't want to attract too much attention and get caught trespassing. The lights were all dead as Kat led the group, her hand being tightly squeezed by Danny next to her, the two boys behind. None of them had been sure what to expect. It wasn't exactly like anyone in the group had ever set foot inside a TV studio before, but they were met with a narrow, concrete-walled corridor, so underwhelming that it almost made it extraordinary in just how profoundly dull it was. Lifting his torch, Leo pointed out some lettering on the wall that read, To TMDG Set, with an arrow pointing the four friends further down the corridor. Naturally driven by her curiosity and need to be literally anywhere apart from her hometown, Kat followed the arrow's direction to another door. Pushing it open, she stepped inside, her torchlight immediately being blocked by a thick curtain. Brushing her hand against the material, she started looking for a parting, but before she could... Welcome, contestants! A voice boomed through the dark, coming from somewhere in the space beyond the curtain. Instantly, Danny screamed at the sound, almost wrenching Kat's arm off in sheer surprise. Before we begin... The voice continued. I need you all to tell me, are you ready? Kat shot a look back at Ricky, the friend furthest behind her, fumbling with the door they'd entered through. It was locked. 
He couldn't get it to budge. He turned and met Kat's gaze, shaking his head. Uh, sure, we're ready. Leo suddenly piped up, calling out to answer the voice. Before the rest of the group could turn and glare at him, the curtain around them lifted. So much bright light came pouring in that it practically dazed the four of them, each taking a moment to readjust. When her vision cleared, Kat saw they were standing in a huge soundstage, blinding spotlights pointing at her and her friends from somewhere above, with seating area big enough to seat their town's entire population. In that case, folks, you know what time it is! came the voice again, talking as if there was a live studio audience present, despite every chair being unoccupied. These four lucky challengers will go head to head, each one looking to take home the victory as well as a huge mystery prize, but only if they dare to take on the most dangerous game. There was a pause, as if this unseen announcer was waiting for a round of applause. Without warning, more lights came on, illuminating the space in front of the four very confused friends. Standing before them was what looked like part of an obstacle course, a series of four horizontal beams over an empty space. The glare of the light was so intense that even squinting, Kat couldn't tell what was beneath. It just looked like a void, nothing but total darkness, with four narrow beams bridging the gap between where they stood and another platform beyond. Well, what are you all standing around waiting for? The announcer declared, almost mocking the four teens urging them on. <laughs> oh, the rules, of course. There was another awkward pause, like the voice was waiting for laughter. It's simple. The four of you will be competing to make it through each of our obstacles. Make it to the end before our timer hits zero and you'll be tonight's big winner. But fall behind or cheat and it's out with you. A huge digital countdown illuminated on one side of the soundstage, telling the group they only had 10 minutes to play. Kat, Leo, Danny, and Ricky barely had a chance to question what was going on, exchanging quick, concerned looks before the announcer started urgently counting them down. Three, two, one! He cheered. Simultaneously, the four teenagers felt a presence looming behind them, like a figure was standing just out of view, blocking them from turning back. Carefully putting one foot in front of the other, Kat started shimmying along the beam in front of her trying to keep herself steady while also moving as fast as she could without falling. Out of the corner of her eye, she could also see Danny on the beam next to her, doing the same, but finding it a little easier to balance. Leo was having no problem at all, sidestepping with enough speed to keep him practically neck and neck with Kat. But Ricky was wobbling. Every foot he placed on the beam, he felt like it might give way beneath him. But it was just a game show, right? Sure, it shouldn't even really be running right now, but regardless of why or how, the worst that could happen was that he would fall. His next step missed the beam entirely and Ricky could feel himself toppling. Guys? He called out to his friends, trying to shift his weight onto his back leg. Kat, Danny, and Leo all froze and snapped their heads back to look at him, just in time to see Ricky wildly flailing his arms. His whole body toppled to one side, and he dropped off the beam with a loud scream. Not one of them saw him land, or even heard it for that matter. It was as if Ricky had just been swallowed up whole by the dark void beneath them, his scream getting more and more distant until it couldn't be heard anymore. Oh, tough break. Talk about falling at the first hurdle. The voice exclaimed, as if what had just happened was some kind of joke. So long, Ricky. We hardly knew you. Staying perfectly still, but clearly distressed, Danny called out Ricky's name. There was no answer. Kat just stared wide-eyed at the abyss below only looking away as she heard Leo jump the last bit of his beam onto the platform. Danny, come on! Kat whispered to her friend, who looked back at her with tears streaming down her face. The pair of them carefully stepped further along their respective beams, trying to stop themselves from looking down or at the huge clock, seconds ticking away and putting them under even more undue pressure. Reaching the other side, Danny dropped to her knees, unable to hold back her sobbing. Kneeling down to comfort her, Kat looked up at the soundstage's bright lights for any sign of who was putting them through this. Bring Ricky back, she yelled. I'm sorry, the announcer replied, the game show bravado dropping from their voice. But you agreed to play. He'll be fine, Leo said. Bet you anything, he just screamed like that to scare us. Leo, you don't seriously believe that, Kat asked as she helped Danny stand up, wiping her friend's tears away. Is he dead? She sobbed. I, I don't know. Kat replied honestly. Of course he's not, Leo interjected. It's a soundstage. It's not like this place is dangerous. Then why was it abandoned? Danny asked. Leo didn't give her an answer, 
either because he was distracted by the lights coming up on the next part of the obstacle course, or because he didn't know and wouldn't admit it. Ahead of them was a long stretch of the course, forming a narrow, square-shaped walkway. Wide portions of the top side were dropping to the bottom in regular intervals, separating the tight space before opening it up again. Every time the segments lifted up, the three remaining contestants could see all the way to the other side of the walkway, where a new platform waited for them. With Danny under one arm, Kat looked at the far end of the walkway as it disappeared and reappeared behind the rising and falling segments. Then she noticed the timer, the seconds rapidly ticking down. But Leo had noticed it too, and turned to look at the two girls with a determined expression. Kat shook her head at him, but it was too late. With all his strength, Leo shoved Danny and Kat, both of them landing flat on their backs on the platform. He bolted towards the walkway as fast as he could, managing to dodge between each portion, pausing as they came down, only to run into the next one as they lifted back up. Helping Danny back to her feet, Kat ran after Leo. He already had a head start and would easily make it to the other side of the walkway before the girls. So instead, Kat held Danny close and took it slow, methodically waiting for each segment to lift back up before they went further into the next safe zone. They were gaining on Leo, who was sprinting to the finish between the rise and fall of the ceiling's crushing weight. Kat watched him disappear behind each block, only to see his back when it came back up. He had made it to the platform opposite, panting but otherwise unscathed when she next lost sight of him. That's when the announcer spoke up again. Now, now, Leo, it said. That was hardly fair, was it? And we all know what happens when you break the rules. As the segment in front of her and Danny rose again, Kat caught sight of Leo just ahead, but it was what was standing behind him that stopped her in her tracks. Two huge figures, each like a shadow without anything casting it, towered over Leo. One of them reached forward and grabbed him, shrouding him in a cloak of darkness, and he was gone. Just like Ricky, he vanished. Kat had been so transfixed by what she had just witnessed that she didn't notice where she was standing, right under a block that was about to drop. Grabbing her hand again, Denny pulled her out of the path of the descending slab. Kat felt it brush against the back of her leg just as the pair of them made it out on the other end and onto the platform, the last two contestants. And then there were two! The announcer cheered, pausing again for a reaction from the empty room. We don't want to play this sick game anymore, Danny yelled. Well, you made it this far, the unseen host replied. Time for our third and final challenge, the final stretch of the course. Make it through this and you're home free. But fail or break the rules like Leo, and you'll be disqualified. Game over. It's okay, Danny, Kat whispered. Whatever's next, we'll get through it. Do you think the boys will come back if we do? Her friend asked. Just like Leo had, Kat didn't answer. The lights revealed the last stretch of the course. The final platform was overhead, a net climbing wall in front of them. It was a straight vertical ascent up with a wall behind the next and holes in its surface. Wasting no time, both Kat and Danny started climbing up the rungs of the thick rope, staying level with each other as they went higher. And then they're off. Look at them go, ladies and gentlemen. The announcer commented, still speaking as if to an audience. But it's not gonna be so easy! The sharp sound of metal made both girls gasp, as long spikes shot forward from the holes in the wall. The blades retracted, fortunately having missed Danny and Kat, this time. What had started as a simple climb up had become something akin to a twisted game of whack-a-mole, with each of them trying to avoid staying in front of the holes in the wall for too long, dodging the spikes as they went in and out. They climbed higher and higher until... Cat! Danny screamed. She looked over her shoulder, only to notice she was in the lead. Below her, Danny was calling up to her with a fear-stricken expression. Her foot was caught in the rigging of the net, kicking and thrashing wildly to try and free it. Cat looked back up. She was almost at the platform, close enough to nearly reach it with her fingertips. But behind her, her friend was stuck, and with no idea when the spikes would come next shooting out of the wall. Kat threw herself over the edge of the platform and landed on her back, just as she heard the gut-wrenching sound of the spikes extending ring out. She was beside herself, tears streaming down her face. It wasn't uncommon for people to be overwhelmed to the point of tears at the end of a game show, but Kat wasn't crying with joy. We have a winner! The disembodied voice declared, barely audible to the surviving contestant as she wept. After she'd finished explaining what had happened to the police, a group of mysterious agents flocked to the soundstage to lock it down, stopping anyone else from getting close to it. 
They'd found a VHS tape in the mailbox at the front office of the studio. On it was a recording of a game show, a live audience cheering as one by one, Ricky, Leo, and Danny failed to complete the course. One of the SCP Foundation agents had come to interview Kat, asking her to recount the whole story all over again. Her account lined up perfectly with everything seen on the tape. Then the agent asked her what her prize had been after she won. A car, Kat replied. The four of us always wanted to leave home. It's frightening to think about how many people go missing each year. Approximately 1,600 individuals mysteriously vanish each year in national parks alone. One moment they're there, making their way down a hiking trail or stopping for a granola bar by a lake, and the next, they're gone. Missing people are an unfortunate fact of life, one we all just try to put out of our minds as we silently hope we, and those we know and love, will be fortunate enough to avoid joining the ranks of the lost. But some places, some very strange, obscure places, nestled in the quiet countryside and tucked away under blankets of fog, lose so many people that it becomes, well, anomalous. One particular town, a seemingly innocuous place with a thriving tourism industry, was the site of so many unexplained disappearances that it drew the attention of the SCP Foundation. They dispatched a team to enter the town, to gather as many facts and figures as they could, and to see what exactly had become of these missing people. Leading the team was none other than the sometimes fearless, often shameless, Dr. Jack Bright. How did the infamous Dr. Bright get here? Well, for many employees of the SCP Foundation, leading a task force to investigate a new, potentially anomalous location would be a promotion or a welcome diversion from yet another round of testing to see if maybe something will finally destroy SCP-682. But in this particular case, it was a matter of discipline. After Dr. Bright was caught giving SCP-999 a triple shot of espresso to, quote, just see what would happen, he was assigned to field work as part of his punishment. For the record, what happened was SCP-999 ricocheting off the walls at such a high speed and intensity that it broke several windows, damaged the ceiling, and knocked out the power for half of the site. And so, Dr. Bright found himself with a task force of Foundation operatives trudging reluctantly through beautiful but boring rural New England toward the town of interest. As he drove down the winding road, grumbling to himself and wishing he could be anywhere else, he spotted the sign marking their intended destination, Welcome to Silent Hill. Up ahead, a thick fog rolling off the lake covered the town in a dim gray blur. He couldn't make out anything through the unnaturally dense haze. He squinted and turned on the high beams, but the light did nothing to cut through the fog, bouncing off of it like a billowing curtain of white. Just as they passed the sign, the van began to slow rapidly, its engine sputtering and grinding as the vehicle skidded to a sudden stop. Damn it! Dr. Bright thumped the steering wheel in frustration. Any of you know how to fix a car? He looked at the team of operatives in the back seat. They all shrugged non-committally. The only thing worse than wandering into that fog would be sitting in the broken down van watching Tweedledum and Tweedledumber try to attend to the failing engine. His private joke almost lifted his mood, but not quite. He popped open the door and stepped out into the cold, damp air. Well, figure it out. I'm gonna go look around. Dr. Bright shoved his hands into his pockets and, not knowing what might wait on the other side, began his walk into Silent Hill. With each step, he ruminated on the events that had gotten him here. Where did those guys at the Foundation get off disciplining him like an unruly child? Sure, he liked his pranks, he enjoyed a good joke, and maybe sometimes he took it just a little bit too far but he'd like to see them confront the existential dread of immortality without needing a humorous outlet every now and then. They'd crack under the pressure without a release of some kind, so what gave them the right to put him, a brilliant, if unconventional mind, in some kind of glorified time out? He scoffed out loud to himself, and the sound echoed in the vacant streets. The sheer emptiness of it all snapped him out of his self-pity, and for the first time, he looked up to take in his surroundings. The stubborn fog refused to dissipate, no matter how far he walked, but at least he could make out the shape of the buildings now, of parked cars on the side of the road. No, not parked, wrecked, abandoned, left to rust. He scanned the fog for human silhouettes, listened for voices, for any signs of life, but there was no one. 
He approached a building and found it dilapidated, rotted wood collapsing in on itself. Windows cracked, door boarded up tight. The buildings next to it looked very much the same. What the hell? He was sent to investigate recent disappearances, but this town looked as if its entire population had vanished decades ago. Or, he thought with a small shudder, all decided to leave in a hurry. What could have driven them out? Okay, that's it, I'm done. Dr. Bright remarked, turning a swift 180 degrees and preparing to go back the way he came. As he did, he froze. Where there had once been continuous unbroken road, the street now ended in a jagged edge, a deep, dark chasm, the only thing that waited beyond. It was too broad to jump across, and he couldn't see another road out of town. Hey, guys? He called out, hoping to draw the attention of one of the men he had left with the van. A little help over here? But there was no response. Hello? He shouted again, louder this time. When no one answered, he repeated to himself again and again with increasing desperation, his voice growing hoarse from the effort. Had they somehow fixed the van and left him there? Had they fallen into the chasm where the road once was and been killed on impact? There was no rational explanation for what was at play here. But as the consciousness of a man living inside of an ancient amulet reminded himself, he very rarely encountered rational things in his life. There had to be a way out. He just had to find it. If he can go back, well, he would just have to keep moving forward. On through the winding labyrinth of the street, through the maze of crumbling buildings looking for any signs of life, he followed a natural bend in the road and suddenly found himself wedged between two buildings down a narrow, claustrophobic alley. It seemed that this place didn't feel much like playing by the ordinary rules of time and space, and while Dr. Bright could usually appreciate a rule breaker, being a little rebellious himself, that uncertainty was putting him on edge. His breaths came in shallow gasps, his chest tight with apprehension. As he turned in a circle, looking for the best way out, he heard a sound behind him, the first noise he had heard other than his own breathing in quite some time. It was the soft, plodding sound of uneven footsteps, like someone small, walking with a limp. He whirled around to face the noise and saw what he might have mistaken for a child until he got a proper look at it. The thing that was steadily approaching him was small and humanoid in shape, but that was where the similarities to a human being ended. Its skin was a pale, mottled gray, the shade of a body fished out of a river after weeks of bloating and decay. Its mouth was a twisted, gaping hole, more like a wound than a mouth, and in place of its eyes were a pair of slits in the pale flesh. It stumbled as it walked, like it was still learning how, but the childish ineptitude did nothing to distract from the creature's menace. As it advanced towards Dr. Bright, he saw the glint of something metal. In the creature's gnarled fist, it held a rusty knife. As it got closer, it slashed haphazardly in his direction, and its mouth opened wider to let out a chilling, high-pitched giggle. This thing was preparing to carve him up and enjoy every second of the job. As he took in the sight of the horrible gray child in front of him, Dr. Bright had been frozen to the spot, unable to force his legs to carry him away. But the sight of the knife, the grim realization of just exactly what this thing had in store for him, shocked him back to life. He grabbed a wooden beam leading up against the nearest wall and threw it at the little monster, knocking it onto its back. It was immobilized just long enough for Dr. Bright to get his bearings, turn, and run toward the wider street. As he did, he could hear the gleeful laughter as the creature climbed back to its feet, and it only pushed him to run faster. When he could no longer hear the little footsteps or the warped giggles of the great child, Dr. Bright stopped to catch his breath. So it seemed like there was still life in Silent Hill after all. There just wasn't human life. There was silence for a moment. Nothing but Dr. Bright's heart pounding in his head as he bent over his knees and silently cursed himself for not exercising this body more often. Then the shrill cry of an air raid siren ripped through the foggy air, and for a moment, his heart stopped. What the hell did that sound mean? He stood up inspecting his surroundings for signs of danger. For what? A tornado? A bomb? He wasn't sure, but nothing could have prepared him for what he saw next. The entire landscape had shifted around him in an instant. He was unsure of how exactly to describe it, except to say that this world had gotten darker, more dangerous. Where the streets had been lit by dim gray sunlight filtered through the haze, there was now darkness, save for an occasional street lamp with a flickering red bulb. He couldn't be sure if it was a trick of the light, but he could swear there was blood staining the street. 
smeared across the brick walls of buildings on either side. The town had been ominous before, but now it was like something out of a nightmare. And all the while, the siren continued to blare, warning of a danger he could not see. He needed to find shelter. That was it. From what, he didn't know. But whatever was coming could not be good. Dr. Bright ran to the nearest door, twisting the knob, trying to yank it open, but it wouldn't budge. The hinges were rusted shut, and there was no time to try and force them open. He tried another door, and another, and another. It was as if the houses knew to try and keep him out, to keep him exposed and vulnerable on the outside. Finally, he reached a two-story house with peeling white paint and a mahogany door, one that looked so familiar, but that he couldn't quite place. When he turned the knob, the door creaked open with ease, and he quickly raced inside, slamming the door shut behind him and locked it. As Dr. Bright slumped against the door, overtaken with exhaustion, an intrusive thought made his stomach drop. Was he alone in this house? Had he really found shelter? Or had he just shut himself inside with something even worse than what waited out there? In the silence, he could swear he heard the quiet thumping of a pulse, but he couldn't tell if it was his own or the house's beating heart. He couldn't just stay here, dreaming up all the horrors that might be waiting. He needed to gather data, investigate his surroundings, and come up with potential solutions. He needed to be a scientist. On unsteady legs, Dr. Bright began to walk the halls of the house, taking in his surroundings properly for the first time. It was dusty and dark, a place left vacant for quite some time, but there were signs of a life once lived within the house's walls. A rocking horse in the corner, a shelf full of well-worn books. The titles scratched an itch in his brain, memories he hadn't touched in decades. Strange that so many of the books in this house would remind him of the pages he once flipped through, staying inside to read while his brother played in the yard outside. His brother. Dr. Bright swallowed the lump in his throat at the thought of TJ. No use going down that path. Not right now. He continued his walk through the house, taking in the cobwebs, the couch covered with plastic, the coffee table, and the TV set. Along the hall leading to the bathroom, there were rows of family pictures hanging in neat little frames. He stopped to take a look, wondering what sort of family had once lived here. As his eyes fell on the first photograph, his blood turned to ice in his veins. A boy looked out from within the frame, a familiar boy with a mop of red hair, a freckled nose, and kind, smiling eyes. No, Dr. Bright whispered to himself, but there was no denying it. It was TJ, his brother, somehow, looking at him from inside a photograph in an abandoned house in Silent Hill. Next, there was a photo of TJ and an older man. Dr. Bright's stomach turned. Their father. Every photograph was of his family, the family he would never know again, not the way they were. And there in one photo in the middle, TJ and his father were joined by another figure, one with the face scratched out of the picture. He knew, though he couldn't see for certain, that it was him, removed from the family photo by force, but the bond between them all forever broken. TJ's eyes in the picture seemed to be filled with tears, heartbroken. His father glowered out of the frame at him, pure hatred in his gaze. He couldn't look anymore and turned away. On the opposite wall, another photograph of TJ was waiting. Dr. Bright felt bile rising in his throat. He recognized the photo. He saw it sometimes when he closed his eyes at night. It was a picture taken with SCP-978, the Desire Camera, the anomalous camera that reveals its subject's innermost desires. In the photo, TJ's hands were pressed to the lens like an animal clawing at the boundaries of its cage. His eyes were filled with tears, spilling over and streaming down his cheeks, and his mouth was wide open in an endless scream of fear and agony. This, Dr. Bright knew, was the wordless scream inside his brother's mind at all times, after so much testing with the Foundation had destroyed him. I tried to help you, he whispered to the picture. I did what I could do. I did what I could to take the pain away. He trailed off, the words dying in his throat as the sound of a heavy, rattling breath came from the room at the end of the hall. It was a thick, wheezing sound, like a death rattle a dozen times over. He didn't want to see what was making the noise, but as if in a trance, he found his feet carrying him towards it. He crossed the threshold of what should have been in the kitchen, but instead found himself in a dimly lit hospital. 
The air smelled of formaldehyde and dried vomit, the steady beep of a heart monitor joining the chorus of heavy, agonizing breathing. At the end of the long hall, there was one single room, the door standing slightly ajar. With slow, agonizing steps, Dr. Bright approached the room. The breathing grew louder and louder, the beep of the heart monitor almost deafening in his ears. He could barely separate the strange breathing from his own, finding his breaths coming in time with the painful, rattling sound. He pushed the door open and saw a figure lying in a hospital bed. It was once human, but it could only be described now as a conglomerate of disease and pain. On top of the figure's head, thinning in patches but still recognizable, was a lock of red hair. No, TJ, no. Dr. Bright's voice broke off in a sob at the sight. The thing that was once his brother turned, seeking the sound of his voice though he could not see. Isn't this what you wanted? A low voice rumbled behind him. Dr. Bright whirled around to see a dark shadow, red eyes glowing in the low light. It moved like a wisp of black smoke, but he knew that voice well enough to tell him just who it was. His father. You let them do this to him. I... I didn't... I didn't mean for this to happen, Dr. Bright stammered. You didn't care! The demon father roared, and the light bulb above their heads flared and burst, sending shards of glass scattering everywhere. All he ever did was help people to heal pain, and all you ever did was cause it. Dr. Bright found the strength to move, running through the doorway, sending the shape of his father in every direction as the smell of sulfur and blood filled his nose. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! He wept as he ran, hearing his father's agonized cries, his brother's labored breathing as he tore back down the hospital hall. As he did, hands began to reach through the walls, the floor, the ceiling. They were rotting, flesh gone green and stiff. Arms followed the hands, then shoulders, then faces. He recognized D-Class uniforms, lab coats, face after familiar face. Everyone who had ever worn the amulet, he realized with a sudden wave of nausea. Everyone whose body he had taken, who he had killed, so that he could live. This is what you do. He could hear his father's voice just behind him, the curls of black smoke nipping at his heels. What kind of creature kills to live? Something that deserves to die. But you can't, can you? You're a parasite, sucking all the good and the life from this world until it's an empty husk, just like you. The living graveyard of victims reached for Dr. Bright, tearing at his clothes as he passed them. There were so many, he never realized how many until he saw them all lined up like this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, he said to every face he passed, but there was no forgiveness in their dead eyes. His father's voice fell silent, but there was no reprieve. Instead, there was the sound of heavy footsteps pursuing him, the grating shriek of a large bladed weapon dragging along the ground. Dr. Bright glanced over his shoulder and saw a massive hulking figure, like a man, but with a jagged metal pyramid covering his head. He was clad in blood-stained clothing and approaching Dr. Bright with the casual menace of something that had killed endless times before and was ready to do it again. It didn't care to chase him. It knew it would eventually catch up. As he looked at the figure, it began to warp, to change. It morphed into something else something he recognized. A man with black hair and gray eyes that revealed nothing but cold malice. A body covered in tattoos of the arcane and the occult, of merciless grinning faces belonging to ancient monsters. And in his hand, a long bladed weapon, a curved sword perfectly engineered for battle. It was impossible he should be contained, but there he was. SCP-076-2 looking at Dr. Bright the same way he had on the day he had first worn the amulet, the day he became an abomination. The sound of his brother's breathing grew louder, his father's voice bellowing in his mind, and he felt the grasp of the fallen Foundation employees at his back. It was all too much, too many reminders of every failure, every hurt. Dr. Bright collapsed to his knees and bared his neck to Abel in submission. You're right, I, I should be punished. I've done nothing but hurt and kill and destroy everything I touch. Just punish me, please. I'm begging you. Then something Dr. Bright never could have expected. The figure that looked like Abel but couldn't be began to laugh. A cruel, hollow sound. 
<laughs> no, it said in a voice that sounded like a chorus of hundreds. We will release you. Nothing we can do here will ever be worse than the eternity of torment that stretches before you. Good luck to you, Dr. Bright. Jack Bright let out a wail of agony, reaching out to Abel with pleading hands as the entity turned and slowly walked away, leaving him there alone with the hell that was his thoughts. Then everything faded to black. Dr. Bright? Dr. Bright! The sound of one of his team members brought Dr. Bright back to consciousness and he opened his eyes. He was lying on the side of the same road he had walked along before, right next to the sign welcoming the group to Silent Hill. You're all still here, he asked weakly. What do you mean? The man looked puzzled. We parked the van, you got out, you fell down, and we've been trying to wake you up. How long was I out? Dr. Bright's vision swam as he tried to wrap his mind around the information. I don't know, about 10 minutes? Have you ever had a nightmare that you're running down a long, dark hallway, getting chased by something you can't see? The thing behind you isn't fast, but that doesn't matter. You can't run forever, and the thing knows it. It is a patient predator. It toys with its food. At first, you move with speed and rhythm. The metallic scraping noise behind you grows quieter. You run and stumble through the dark. Your muscles start to ache and your lungs burn. Your pace slows. It's still coming. You can hear the scraping getting louder. You start to panic. It's completely dark. You don't know where you're running or even what you're running from. All you know, as you bump against the walls and the sharp corners that rush towards you, is that you can't run forever. You trip, fall, and pain explodes through your legs as your knee shatters on the concrete ground. That scraping is getting louder. You can barely breathe. You can't run anymore with your injury. There's no way to stop what's coming. There is no escape. The scraping is right behind you. You scream, and then you wake up. Your heart is pounding like thunder in your chest, and your sheets are soaked with sweat, but you're safe. You're out of those awful dark hallways. But what if this wasn't just a nightmare? What if this scenario was real, and there was no escape from the horror chasing you in the darkness? That's what it's like to have a close encounter with SCP-1918, a sadistic sentient object that loves playing twisted games with its prey. But this monster never plays fair, and even worse, it's always just a simple door away. It may even be hiding behind a door near you right now, waiting to start a game with its new playmate. But soon you'll understand why some doors should never, ever be opened, and why some games are better left unplayed. SCP-1918 is an anomaly with two parts, SCP-1918 itself and SCP-1918-2 the monster's underground lair. The duo are a match made in hell, as the chambers and hallways of 1918-2 are perfectly tailored to 1918's violent hobbies. Nobody knows how long this anomaly has been operating, but it's probably behind countless disappearances. After all, 1918 has a habit of breaking its toys. The nightmare began in a small town in Maine, with a population of only 226 people. But that population was about to get lower. People in the town began to report strange noises at night, a droning metal-on-concrete scraping noise, like someone dragging a lead pipe along the ground. At first, people just ignored the sound. It was all in their heads or maybe just a faulty oven or a washing machine on the fritz. Anything that would allow them to forget about the noise and get on with their daily lives. But the noises were coming from below. They could be heard out on the streets most audibly near manholes and sewer grates. People started feeling unsafe in their homes. The noises were spooking animals and children. People were losing sleep. That scraping they all tried to ignore was beginning to get to them all. Letters, emails, and angry phone calls to the town council were piling up. Something had to be done before the whole town went crazy with fear. The mayor authorized four utility workers to investigate the source of the noise at a local sewage treatment facility. Considering the scraping was loudest near the sewer grates, everyone just assumed that whatever was causing all this must be connected to the sewers. Four utility workers were sent to investigate the facility, only to find that the machinery on site was working just fine. The source of the problems must have been coming directly from the underground sewer lines themselves. 
The four workers equipped with headlamps descended into a long service tunnel that fed into the sewer system. As they passed deeper into the tunnel, the darkness around them became thicker. It was a tangible presence that drowned out the light of their headlamps, similar to the anomalous phenomenon exhibited by SCP-087. When the utility workers tried to turn back, they discovered another impossibility. It seemed that the tunnel behind them had become a solid concrete wall. They were trapped, but where? It was too dark to tell. Confused and terrified, the four men stuck together, attempting to find a way out. It was too dark to see their hand in front of their face, so all they could do was navigate slowly by feeling the walls around them. These walls felt old, crusty. There was a kind of faint metallic stench hanging in the air too, like old blood. Something horrible had happened here, and something horrible was about to happen again. All they could do was keep moving and try to stay calm. Eventually, after hours of pawing at the walls in the dark, they found an open doorway. One by one, they filed inside, only to feel blinded when bright white ceiling lights suddenly switched on. The room was all white and filled with pipes, large and small, running from wall to wall. Just then, one of the utility workers let out an ear-splitting scream and pointed towards the doorway. His colleagues turned and gasped in shock. There was something outside the door, and it was staring at them. The object filled up almost the entire doorway. It seemed like a demonic hobby horse made from a black and white candy-striped metal pole with a crude plastic head on top. The head looked like a clown's with a wide, toothy grin, but no visible eyes. It was SCP-1918. The utility workers were frozen as the object leaned forward slightly and slithered into the room, the bottom of the metal pipe scraping against the ground. It was the exact same scraping noise that had been haunting the concerned townsfolk up above. This was the thing behind it all, and as the object moved, its metal pole started to scrape words into the ground, tick, tack, toe. None of the four utility workers were ever seen again. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to descend upon this quiet main town and pick up the pieces. All relevant officials were provided amnestics, and cover stories were created for the disappearances of the four utility workers. The Foundation also commandeered the sewage treatment facility that held the entrance to SCP-1918-2, replacing all key roles at the facility with undercover Foundation personnel. SCP-1918 was given a Euclid classification due to the fixed nature of its hunting grounds, and then the real research began. The Foundation soon made some disturbing discoveries. Entrances into the SCP-1918-2 area didn't follow any kind of logic. The hunting ground of SCP-1918 can be entered from almost any location, if you're unlucky enough. There are currently nine known entrances, including five sewage grates, three utility shafts located in a sewage facility, and one toilet. And these are just the ones that the Foundation knows about. There are a huge number of ways to enter SCP-1918-2, but to this day, nothing has ever been able to leave. SCP-1918-2 is contained 20 meters below the streets of this unassuming main town. Personnel, aside from Foundation-approved D-Class guinea pigs, are refused entrance. Researchers have mapped out the layout of 1918-2 through seismic imaging of SCP-1918's movements. There are 18 identical room pairs in SCP-1918-2, or nine compound rooms. Rooms are differentiated between a one-room and a two-room by crude carvings on the floors outside of the individual rooms. SCP-1918-2 is symmetrical with half a meter wide paths circling each compound room. The only deviation to this construction are the location of entrances on the sides of each individual room, which vary randomly while the location is active. What exactly does SCP-1918 do in this private little maze? It plays games, of course. Its two favorites, as indicated by the words it scrapes into the ground, are tic-tac-toe and memory. In tic-tac-toe, 1918 moves to each one room, leaving behind X markings on the floors if the room is not already marked with an O, in a manner similar to a game of tic-tac-toe. How a victim is meant to accomplish making a mark or understanding this process is unknown, as no aids are given. Blood is commonly used by victims to make their markings, hence the rusty smell in many of the rooms. 
In memory, the trapped victim is rendered unconscious by blunt force, presumably from SCP-1918. The subject regains consciousness in a random section of the facility. Success is marked by finding a one room identical to the central room. This event seems to possess a time limit, as the subject is pursued by SCP-1918 through the halls of the facility. The subject wins by marking the correct room with an O. What happens if you win or lose these games? It's important to note that SCP-1918 is very competitive and doesn't play fair. If you win, the object will merely accuse you of cheating and start a new game. This will happen again and again until eventually you lose. And what do you do? Well, take the horrifying encounter D-Class personnel member D-2934 had with SCP-1918. Wearing video and audio equipment, D-2934 was led into SCP-1918-2 by Foundation researchers. When he eventually found his way to the central room, 1918 challenged him to a game of tic-tac-toe. And against all odds, D-2934 won the game. But 1918 didn't take kindly to that. It accused D-2934 of cheating, carving its accusations into the ground before challenging him to a deadly game of memory. After hours of chasing, D-2934 eventually lost his mind and was backed into a corner by 1918. As the object made its way towards him, he panicked, ripped a pipe from the wall, and began smashing 1918's head. As the plastic cracked under the force of the blows, Foundation scientists could see real brains inside. D-2934 screamed, and the video feed cut off. When the video turned back on some time later, 1918 stared into the camera with a different head mounted atop its metal pole, one that just a few hours earlier had belonged to the unfortunate D-2934. If there's one lesson to be learned from this terrifying anomaly, it's that there truly is no escape from SCP-1918. You're sitting in the middle of a cheering crowd. The arena around you is electric, fans hollering from their seats as they watch the basketball game. Every point scored, every shot missed, and every skillful pass of the ball sends waves of excitement over everyone in the audience. Applause, shouts, and chants fill the air. It distracts you for a moment. You find yourself swept up in the energy of the game. But slowly, surely, a nagging feeling creeps up on you as your eyes follow the ball. That feeling turns to a sickening realization as one of the players jumps and dunks the basketball, scoring another two points. You notice the look on his face, the same look on the faces of all the other players on the court, a solemn, hopeless expression. It's the same look of silent despair worn by all the spectators around you. Then you remember, you've watched this exact game of basketball before, many, many times before. And that is when you feel the same hopeless expression appear on your own face, realizing just how long you have been here, watching this game over and over, reminded that you will never, ever leave this arena. Welcome to SCP-1733. To the untrained eye, SCP-1733 seems to be a completely harmless item. Stored in a digital video recorder, it is kept securely in the dusty depths of the SCP Foundation's video archives. If any researcher is given permission to study SCP-1733, they will find it to be an ordinary VHS tape. But what about the contents of said tape? Does it contain a bizarre, disconnected series of black and white video clips that when viewed only give the watchers seven days before the spirit of a drowned girl comes crawling out of their TV screen to kill them? Well, not exactly. But we're sure that if such a tape exists, the Foundation probably has it under lock and key, too. The footage on SCP-1733 is as seemingly banal as the ordinary VHS tape itself. When played, the viewer will witness a TV broadcast of a basketball game specifically the 2010-2011 NBA season opener, broadcast on television and captured on tape by an unknown civilian. The game took place on the 26th of October 2010 in the TD Garden Arena in Boston, Massachusetts, a game where the hometown Boston Celtics took on the Miami Heat. By now, perhaps you are wondering what is so special about this particular game, and why the SCP Foundation would be so interested in keeping a VHS recording of it so secure. Is one of the O5 Council secretly a Celtics fan? 
While that's impossible to say for sure, what we do know for certain is that SCP-1733 is far more than just a harmless recording of a basketball game. The SCP Foundation first caught wind of SCP-1733's existence the day after the game. On October 27th, a Boston native that had watched and recorded the game made comments on social media about a technical foul that the game's referee had failed to pick up on. According to this individual, during the third quarter, an instance of unsportsmanlike conduct took place between Ray Allen and Chris Bosch. The person making these claims was quickly ridiculed by commenters on the same thread, but then this person uploaded a clip of this foul from the footage they had recorded. The other commenters were dumbfounded. During the original broadcast, that foul had never happened, but the recording showed it clearer as day. The footage was quickly expunged and all traces of the clip removed from the internet by personnel acting on behalf of the SCP Foundation. Any that had viewed the video on Facebook or been a part of the comments debating this previously non-existent foul were tracked down via their IP addresses. All of them, including the owner of the tape, were given amnestics to wipe their memories of the supposed infraction, and SCP-1733 was returned to the Foundation for further analysis. Researchers at the Foundation were determined to understand the anomalous nature of SCP-1733, and why the footage contained on this particular VHS tape was so different from the basketball game's original broadcast. At first, the differences in the game seemed to be only slight changes from the one that actually aired on TV. A different foul here, a small point difference there. While the recording of the game contained on SCP-1733 was slightly different from the real-life game, perhaps even more interesting was that these differences changed with repeat viewings. Researchers wouldn't observe the same differences every time they watched SCP-1733, but would instead spot something different that had been changed each time they restarted the tape. And as they continued to watch and rewatch SCP-1733's footage, the true horror of the video's anomalous properties became more and more apparent. As the footage recorded on SCP-1733 began to diverge more and more from the original broadcast, researchers shifted their attention away from the basketball game itself and onto the people watching it. Just like the specifics of the game itself, the fans in the arena seemed to also change with every rewatch of the tape. And even stranger, the people in the crowd seemed to not only be aware of their existence within the footage, but also retain memories of every previous replayed vision. Each time the researchers had watched SCP-1733, the audience trapped within had gained more and more cognizance. Every man, woman, and child in the audience of that basketball game began remembering that they had seen multiple variations of the same game over and over again. This first became apparent to Foundation researchers when the game's commentators, two presenters named Mike and Tommy, began to comment on a strange sense of deja vu they were experiencing as they watched the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat play. Both seemed to share notions that the game they were witnessing was strangely familiar, and in later replays of the tape, these two commentator personalities were able to recall the events of the game with perfect, vivid accuracy. While they never addressed the viewer directly, this cumulative effect seems to have extended to every person that was present within the arena at the time that the original broadcast was recorded. Everyone, from the commentators to the coaches, the players to the patrons, all remember the diverging versions of the basketball game, but seem to have no awareness that they are trapped inside a recording on a VHS tape. It should be noted that it is still unclear whether the entities are real people or digital copies that solely reside on the tape. Every individual shown to be inside TD Garden on the 26th of October 2010 seems to be identical to their counterparts in the real world. Each of the basketball players on both the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat teams have the exact same level of talent as they do in reality and their individual mannerisms are perfectly recreated in the SCP-1733 footage. And the same is true of the fans in the audience, each one appearing to be, in every conceivable way, a living human being. But the most unnerving aspect of SCP-1733 was found when the Foundation agents were tasked with tracking down members of the audience who were seen on the tape, and they found nothing. Unlike the players and coaches who can quite easily be found in our world, with many of them still playing or involved with professional basketball, 
personnel were unable to find a single trace of any of the people from the audience, not one clue as to their current whereabouts or status. It is unclear how, but it appears that everyone shown on SCP-1733, especially those watching the game unfold from the stands, is a person trapped in digital form, stuck watching variations of the same match on loop. Researchers at the SCP Foundation who were studying SCP-1733 initially theorized that the tape had been designed to display an infinite variety of different game outcomes. Given that the tactics utilized by the players were different with each playback of SCP-1733, this seemed to be the case, that the tape was showing a what-if scenario each time the tape was rewound and played from the start. But the scenario wasn't resetting each time. It was clear that they were learning. By the 34th replay of the footage, the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat were so in tune with the opposing team's playbook that both sides' players were able to perfectly and precisely counter their opponent's moves and kept the score at 0-0 for much of the game. At this stage in the Foundation's research, the players on the SCP-1733 tape had not yet become fully aware that they had played the same game already in earlier playbacks. But it is possible that weak memories of the earlier versions of the same match manifested as instinctive ways players could counter the moves of their rival team. However, by the time Foundation researchers had replayed the SCP-1733 footage 45 times, the players, their coaches, and fans watching the game had become aware of what was happening to them. It was at this point that the digital recording from TD Garden changed dramatically. Realizing that they'd been playing the same game of basketball over and over, the players refused to participate any longer. Everyone in the audience began to attempt to escape from the tape where they'd been unknowingly imprisoned, but not a single one of the stadium's doors would budge, and neither the fans nor the players seemed to be able to leave through any other exit out of TD Garden. Over the following playbacks of the SCP-1733 videotape, attempts at escape grew increasingly daring. In one playback, a full-scale riot broke out. In another, makeshift explosives were built and used by those trapped to try and blast their way to freedom. As their cognition grew and they began to remember friends and family from outside the videotape, the crowd trapped in SCP-1733 grew even more desperate. Players and their coaches retired to locker rooms, withdrawing from the crowd for a time. The rest of the people in the footage began to form factions amongst themselves, one of the more prominent calling themselves the Faith Keepers. These individuals voiced their belief that they had been confined to TD Garden as some form of spiritual punishment as a result of the consumerism that is rife in a post-industrial society. The Faith Keepers began burning offerings in the center of the basketball court. Phones, wallets, car keys, anything that reminded them of the modern world. Over the subsequent playbacks of SCP-1733, the Faith Keepers grew in their numbers, indoctrinating more of the crowd into their movement. Those still trying to escape from the stadium were causing more damage to themselves than their enclosure, with three men caught in the blast of another crude bomb placed on an exit door. Unfortunately for them, the door barely showed a scratch in the aftermath of the detonation. As Foundation researchers continued replaying the tape, those trapped within SCP-1733 descended into depraved acts, and incidences of violence became rampant. Some even attempted to take their own lives in acts of desperation, jumping from balconies in the hopes of ending the loop. Those that had joined the growing ranks of the Faith Keepers did not engage in such behavior, instead creating makeshift curtains to separate themselves from the breakdown that was taking place among the others trapped within the SCP-1733 tape. At some point beyond the 112th playback of the videotape, the Faith Keepers marched off scream and brought the basketball teams back out onto the main court. They then began a ritualistic sacrifice, disemboweling the professional athletes for their fellow prisoners to see. This had no noticeable effect, with the recording of the game resetting as it had done in earlier rewatches. In a later playback, the Faith Keepers then began to call for all the children in the stadium to be sacrificed in the same way. Testing on SCP-1733 was finally suspended indefinitely after this point, and as far as we know, the crowd remains trapped inside the anomalous recording of this particular Celtics Heat basketball game. 
Foundation researchers have been unable to produce the same anomalous effects as those of SCP-1733, even when using the DVR that originally produced the recording. The digital video recorder itself does not seem to imprint the same properties onto other VHS tapes making SCP-1733 an isolated anomaly. However, the next time you find yourself at a basketball game, it might be worth asking yourself, have I seen this game before? Now check out SCP-1861, the crew of the HMS Wintersheimer, and SCP-1337, the Hitchhiker, for more chilling tales from the SCP Foundation.